the scope for like what we could achieve is like really extraordinarily large, like maybe kind of larger than most people kind of typically entertain. And having this kind of property of being like anti-fragile with respect to being wrong, like really celebrating and endorsing, changing your mind in a kind of loud and public way. But you can also do a thing which is try to make a lot of money and just, you know, make a useful product and then use the success of that first thing to then just think squarely, like how do I just do the most good? If you have like 10 million in the bank and you make another 10 million, does your life get twice as good? <laughs> Obviously not, right? If on the other hand, you just care about like making the world go well, <laughs> then the world's an extremely big place. And so you basically don't run into these diminishing returns like at all. There's this question of like, if the many worlds view is true, what if anything could that mean with respect to questions about like, what should we do or what's important? pleasure of interviewing Finn Morehouse, who is a research scholar at the Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute, and he's also an assistant to Toby Ord, and also the host of the Hear This Idea podcast. Um, Finn, I know you've got a ton of other projects under your belt, so do, do you want to talk about all the different things you're working on and how you got into EA and this kind of research? I think you nailed the broad strokes there. I think, yeah, I've kind of failed to specialize in a particular thing and so I found myself just dabbling in projects that seem interesting to me trying to help get some projects off the ground and just doing research on you know things which seem maybe underrated I probably won't bore you with the, the list of things and then yeah how did I get into EA actually also a fairly boring story unfortunately I really loved philosophy I really loved kind of pestering people by asking them all these questions you know why are you not why are you still eating meat read kind of Peter Singer and Will McCaskill and I realized I just wasn't actually living these things, these things out myself. I think there's some just like force of consistency <laughs> that pushed me into really getting involved. And I think the second piece was just the people. Um, I was lucky enough to have this student group where I went to university. And I think there's some dynamic of realizing that this isn't just a kind of free floating set of ideas, but there's also just like a community of people I like really get on with and have all these like incredibly interesting kind of personalities and interests. So um, th those two things, I think. Yeah, and then so what was the process like? Uh, I know a lot of people who are vaguely interested in EA, but not a lot of them then uh, very quickly transitioned to, you know, working on research with top EA researchers. So uh, yeah, just walk me through how you ended up where you are. Yeah, I think I got lucky with the timing of the pandemic, which is not something I suppose many people can say. I did my degree. I was quite unsure about what I wanted to do. There was some option of taking some kind of close to default path of maybe something like, you know, consulting or whatever. And then I was kind of, I guess, forced into this natural break where I had time to step back. And I, you know, I guess I was lucky enough that I could afford to kind of spend a few months just like figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And that space was enough to like maybe start like reading more about these ideas, also to try kind of teaching myself skills I hadn't really tried yet. So try to, you know, learn to code for a lot of this time and so on. And then I just thought, well, I might as well wing it. There are some things I could apply to. I don't really rate my chances, but the cost to applying to these things is so low, it just seems worth it. And then, um, yeah, I guess I got very lucky and here I am. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about one of these things you're working on, which is that you're, you've are you set up um, and are going to be helping judging these prizes about uh, EA writing. One is you're giving out uh, five prizes for $100,000 each for um, blogs that discuss effective altruist related ideas. Another is uh, five prizes of twenty thousand dollars each to criticize EA ideas. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk more about these prizes. Why is why uh, why is now an important time to be uh, talking about and criticizing EA? That is a good question. Um, I want to say I'm reluctant to frame this as like me personally, like any okay, other sure, sure. But yeah, I certainly have helped help set up these um, initiatives. Well, so, so yeah. I, I, heard, I, I heard on the inside that actually you've been uh, you've been pulling a lot of the weight on these projects. Certainly, yeah, I've um, found myself. Uh, with the time to kind of like get these things over the line, which I'm, yeah, I'm pretty happy with. So yeah, the criticism thing, let's we'll start with that. I want to say something like, in general, being receptive to criticism is just like obviously really important. And if as a movement you want to succeed, where succeed means not just like achieve things in the world, but also like end up having just close to correct beliefs as you can get, then having this kind of property of being like, 
anti-fragile with respect to being wrong, like really celebrating and endorsing changing your mind in a kind of loud and public way. That just seems really important. And so I know this is just like a kind of prima facie obvious case of wanting to incentivize criticism. But you might also ask like, why now? There's a few things going on there. One is I think the effective altruism movement overall has reached this place where it's actually beginning to do like a lot of really incredible things. There's a lot of like funders now kind of excited to find find kind of fairly ambitious, scalable projects. And so it seems like if there's a kind of an inflection point, you want to get the criticism out the door and you want to respond to it like earlier rather than later because you want to set the path in the right direction rather than adjust course, which is more expensive later on. Well, McCaskill made this point uh, a few months ago. You can also point to this dynamic in some other social movements where the kind of really exciting beliefs that kind of have this like period of plasticity in the early days, they kind of ossify and you end up with this like set of beliefs that's kind of like trendy um, or socially rewarded to hold. In some sense, you feel like you need to hold certain beliefs in order to kind of get credits from, you know, certain people and the costs to like publicly questioning some practices or beliefs become too high. And that is just like a failure mode. And it seems mm-hmm. like one of the more salient failure modes for a movement like this. So it just seems really important to like be quite, quite proactive about celebrating this dynamic where you notice you're doing something wrong and then you change track. And then maybe that means shutting something down, right? You set a project, the project seems really exciting. You get some like feedback back from the world. Feedback looks more negative than you expected. And so you stop doing the project. And in some important sense, that is like a success. Like you did the correct thing and it's important <laughs> to celebrate that. So I think these are some of the things that go through my, through my head, just like framing criticism in like this kind of positive way. Yeah, it seems pretty important. Right, right. I mean, analogously, it said that uh, losses are as important as profit in terms of motivating uh, economic incentives. And it seems very similar yeah. here. In a Slack, we were talking and you mentioned that uh, maybe one of the reasons it's important now is if if a prize of twenty thousand dollars can help somebody help us figure out how to or uh, not me I, I don't have the money but like help SBF figure out how to uh, how to better allocate like ten million dollars that, mm-hmm. that that's a steal. It's really impressive that effective altruism is a movement that is willing to find criticism of, of itself. I, I don't know. Is there any other example of a movement in history where, where that's been so interested in criticizing itself and becoming anti fragile in this way? I guess one thing I want to say is like the proof is in the pudding here. Like it's one thing to kind of make noises to the effect that you're like interested in being criticized and i'm sure lots of movements make that another thing to like really follow through on them and you know ea is a fairly young movement so i guess time will tell whether it really does that well i'm very hopeful i also want to say that this like particular prize is like you know one kind of part of a much um a much bigger thing hopefully that's a great question i actually don't know if i have good answers but that's not to say that there are none i'm sure there are like political liberalism as a strand of thought, like in political philosophy comes to mind as maybe an example. One other random thing I want to point out or mention, you mentioned profits and just like doing the maths on what's the like EV of like investing in just red teaming an idea, like shooting an idea down. I think thinking about the difference between the for-profit and non-profit space is quite an interesting analogy here. Um, you have this very obvious feedback mechanism in for-profit land, which is you have an idea, no matter how excited you are about the idea, you can very quickly learn whether the world is... Uh, as excited, which is to say you can just fail. And that's like a tight, useful feedback loop to figure out what you're, whether what you're doing is um, worth doing. Those feedback loops don't, by default, exist if you don't expect to get anything back when you're doing these projects. And so that's like a reason to uh, want to implement those things like artificially. Like one way you can do this is with like charity evaluators, which in some sense impose a kind of market-like mechanism where like now you have an incentive to actually be achieving the thing that you're like ostensibly setting out to achieve because there's this third actor that's or party that's kind of assessing whether you're you're getting it but i think that that framing i mean we can try saying say more about it but that's like a really useful framing i think to me anyway Mm. and uh yeah but one other reason this seems important to me is if you have a movement that's about like 10 years old, um, like this, you know, we have, we have like uh, strains of ideas that are thousands of years old that have a significant improvements made to them uh, mm. that, 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 were, that were missing before. So uh, just on that, uh, that alone, it seems to me that the reason to expect some mistakes, e- either at a sort of like theoretical level or, or in the applications, that, that, that does seem like, I, I do yeah. have a strong prior that there are such mistakes that could be identified in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, I guess one framing that I like as well is not just thinking about here's a set of claims we have 
we want to like figure out what's wrong. But some really good criticism can look like, look, you just missed this distinction, which is like a really important distinction to make. Or you miss this like addition to this kind of naive, like conceptual framework you're using. And it's really important to make that addition. A lot of people are like skeptical about progress in in kind of non-empirical fields. So like philosophy, for instance, it's like, oh, we've been thinking about these questions for thousands of years, but we're still kind of unsure. And I think that misses like a really important kind of progress, which is something you might call like conceptual engineering or something, which is finding these like really useful distinctions and then like building structures on top of them. And so it's not like you're making claims which are necessarily true or false, but there are other mm. kinds of useful criticism, which include just like getting your kind of models like more, more useful. Speaking of uh, just make, uh, making progress on questions like these, one thing that's really surprising to me, and maybe this is just like my ignorance of the philosophical history here, it's super surprising to me that a movement like long-termism, at least in its modern form, it, it took thousands of years of philosophy before somebody had the idea that, oh, like the future could be really big, therefore the future <laughs> matters a lot. Um, yeah. And the, so maybe you could say like, oh, you know, there's been lots of movements in history that have emphasized, I mean, existential risk maybe wasn't a uh, prominent thing to think about before nuclear weapons, but that have emphasized that civilizational collapse is a very prominent factor that uh, might be very bad for many centuries. So we should try to make sure our society is stable or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you have some sense of, uh, you have a philosophy background, so do you have some sense, what is the philosophical background here? And to the extent that these are relatively new ideas, how, how did it take so long? Yeah, that's like such a good question, I think. One name that comes to mind straight away is this historian called uh, Tom Moynihan who, so he wrote this book about something like the history of how people think um, about existential risk. And then more recently, he's been doing work on the question you asked, which is like, what took people so long to reach this? Like what now seems like a fairly natural thought. I think part of what's going on here is that it's really hard to, or easy, I should say, to underrate just how much, I guess it's somewhat related to what I mentioned in the last question, just how much kind of conceptual apparatus we have going on that's like a bit like the water we swim in now and so it's hard to notice so one example that comes to mind is thinking about probability as this thing we can talk formally about this is like a shockingly new uh thought also the idea that human history might end and furthermore that that might be within our control that is to decide or to prevent that happening <laughs> prematurely these are all like really surprisingly new thoughts. I think it just like requires a lot of imagination and effort to put yourself into the shoes of people living earlier on who just didn't have the kind of, yeah, like I said, the kind of tools for thinking that make these ideas pop out much more naturally. And of course, as soon as those, those tools are in place, then the like conclusions fall out pretty quickly, but it's not easy. And I agree that like, I appreciate that. Well, actually wasn't a very good answer. Um, just because it's like <laughs> such a hard question. Um, yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is that more recently, um, maybe I'm uh, unaware of the full context of the argument here, but uh, I think I've heard uh, Holden Kornowski write somewhere that he, he thinks that there's more value in thinking about the issues that EA has already identified rather than identifying some sort of unknown risk that, for example, what AI might have been like 10, 20 years ago, AI lemon, I mean, the, g given this historical experience that you can have some very fundamental tools for thinking about the world missing and consequently miss some very important moral implications. Uh, does that imply that we should expect the space that AI alignment occupies in terms of our priorities? Should we expect something as big or bigger coming up? Or just generally tools of thinking like, you know, expected value thinking, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one thing I want to say there is it seems pretty likely that the most important, like kind of useful concepts for finding important things are also going to be the lowest hanging. And... I don't know, I think it's like very roughly correct that we did in fact, like over the course of building out kind of conceptual frameworks, we picked them like the most important ideas first. And now we're kind of like refining things and adding maybe somewhat more peripheral things. Um, that's at least, if that like trend is roughly going to hold, and that's a reason for um, not expecting to find like some kind of earth shattering new concept from left field. Although I think that's like a very weak and vague argument, to be honest. Um, um, also, I guess I guess it depends on what you think your time span is. Like if your time span is the entire span of time that humans have been thinking about things, then maybe you would think that actually it's kind of strange that it took like 3,000 years before, maybe even longer. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess it depends on when you define the start point. It took, you know, 3,000 years for people to realize, hey, we should think in terms of probabilities and in terms of <laughs> expected yeah. impact. 
So in yeah. that sense, maybe it's like, I don't know, it took like 3,000 years of thinking to get to this very basic, uh, very basic idea. What, what seems to us like a very yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, important yeah. and basic idea. I feel like maybe I have, I want to say two things. Uh, if you imagined lining up like every person who ever lived, just like in a row, and then you kind of like walked along that line and saw how much progress people have made across the line. So you're going like across people rather than across time. Then I think like progress in how people think about stuff looks a lot more like linear and in fact started earlier than maybe you might think by just looking at like progress over time and if it was faster early on then if you're kind of following the very long run trend then maybe you should expect like um, not to find these kind of again totally left field ideas soon but I think a second thing which is maybe more important is like I also buy this idea that in some sense um, progress about thinking in thinking about what's like most important is really kind of boundless. Like David Deutsch talks about this kind of thought a lot. When you come up with new ideas, that just generates new problems, new questions, which leads to more ideas. Um, that's very well and good. I think there's some sense in which, you know, one priority now could just be framed as giving us time <laughs> to like make that progress. And even if you thought that like we have this kind of boundless capacity to come up with a bunch of new important ideas, it's pretty obvious that that's like a prerequisite. And therefore, in some sense, that's like a robust argument for thinking that like um, trying not to kind of throw humanity off course and um, preventing, mitigating some of these catastrophic risks is always just going to shake out as like a pretty important thing to do. Maybe one of the most important things. Yeah, that, that, I, 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 I think that's reasonable. Um, but but then, the, then there's a question of like, even if you think that the existential risk is the most important thing, um, to what extent have you discovered all the, uh, again, mm. that like X risk uh, argument? Mm. And I, but by the way, I thought earlier what you said about, uh, you know, trying to extrapolate what we might know from the limits of physical laws, um, it, you know, if, if, if that, that can kind of constrain what we think might be possible. I think that's an interesting idea, but I I wonder like partly like one argument is just like we don't even know how to define those physical constraints and like before you had the theory of computation, it wouldn't even make sense to say like oh uh, th like this much matter can sustain like so much mm -hmm. so much uh, flops uh, floating point operations per second, and then second is like yeah if you know that number it still doesn't tell you like what you could do with it I you know what what, what I think um. Uh, an interesting thing that whole, uh, Karnofsky talks about is uh, he has this article called This Can't Go Odd, where he makes the argument that, listen, if you just have a compounding economic growth, at some point you'll get to the point where, um, you know, like you'll have many, uh, or many, many, many times Earth's economy per atom in the uh, affectable universe. And so it's hard to see like how you could keep having economic growth beyond that point. But that, that mm -hmm. itself seems like, um, I, I don't know, if that's true, then there has to be like a physical law that's like the maximum G, uh, GDP per atom is this, right? Like mm -hmm. if, the, uh, if there's no such constant, then you can like, you should be able to surpass it. I, I guess it still leaves a lot to be desired. To, like, may, uh, even if you could know such a number, you, you don't know like how interesting or what, what, what kinds of things could be done at that point. Yeah, I guess the first one is, you know, even if you think that like preventing these kind of very large scale risks that might like curtail human potential even if you think that's just incredibly important you might miss some of those risks because you're you just aren't able to articulate them or really like conceptualize them i feel like i just want to say at some point uh we have a pretty good understanding of kind of roughly what looks what looks most important like for instance if you kind of i don't know get stranded on a camping trip and you're like we need to just survive long enough to <laughs> to make it out and it's like okay what do we look out for i don't really know what the wildlife is here because i haven't been here before but Probably it's going to look a bit like this. I can at least imagine, you know, the risk of dying of thirst, even though I've never died of thirst before. And then it's like, what? What if we haven't cons like even begun to thought think of like the other? <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe, but it's kind of there's just some like, you know, table thumping practical reason for uh, focusing on the things which are most salient and like definitely spending some time thinking about the things we haven't thought of yet. But um, it's not like that list is just like completely endless. And there's a kind of I guess a reason for that. And then you said the second thing, which I don't actually know if i have like a ton of interesting things to say about although maybe you could try like kind of zooming in on what what you're interested in there 
Uh, I, I come to think of it, I don't think the second thing has that, uh, big implications for this argument, but the, the two, um, uh, yeah, I, I, we have like 20 other topics that are just as interesting uh, <laughs> that we, we, we yeah. can't move on to. But yeah, but j j just as a, uh, I don't know, as a closing note, the, the, the analogy is, is very interesting to me, the camping trip, you're trying to like see, do what needs to be done to survive. I don't know. Okay, so to extend an analogy, it might be like, I don't know, somebody like Eliezer discovers, oh, that berry that we're all about to eat because we feel like that's the only way to get sustenance here while we're, you know, just almost starving. Um, yep. Don't eat that berry because that berry is poisonous. Um, and, and then then you, maybe somebody could point out, okay, so given the fact that we've discovered one poisonous food in this environment, should we expect there to be other poisonous mm -hmm. foods? Uh, that we don't know about. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's anything more to say on that topic. I uh, mean, one thing, well, like one, I guess, kind of angle you could put on this is you can ask this question, like, we have precedent for a lot of things. Like, we know now that uh, igniting nuclear weapons does not ignite the atmosphere, which was a worry that some people had. Mm. Um, so we, we at least have some kind of bounds on how bad certain things can be. And so if you ask this question, like, what is worth worrying about most uh, in terms of what kinds of risks might um, reach this level of potentially posing an existential risk? Well, it's going to be the kinds of things we haven't done yet that we haven't, like, got some experience with. And so you can ask this question, like, what is, what things are there in the space of, like, kind of big seeming but totally novel precedent-free changes or events? And it actually does seem like you can kind of try generating that that list and getting at answers this is why maybe or at least one reason why ai sticks out because it's like fulfills this criteria of being pretty potentially big and transformative and also the kind of thing we don't have any experience with yet but again it's not as if that list is like in some sense endless like there are only so many things we can do in the space of uh decades right Okay, yeah, so uh, moving on to another topic, we're talking about for-profit entrepreneurship as, uh, a, as a potentially impactful thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is it, uh, maybe not in this conversation, but like we, we separately, we, we had- um, at one point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so to clarify, this is not just for-profit in order to uh, do earning to give. So you become mm -hmm. a billionaire and you give your wealth away. To what extent can you identify opportunities where you can just build a co profitable company that solves uh, an important problem area or you know makes people's uh, lives better? Um, one example of this is Wave. It's a company, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, helps with uh, you know transferring money and banking services in Africa. Um, probably has boosted people's uh, well-being in all kinds of different ways. Um, so to what extent can we expect just a bunch of for-profit uh, opportunities for making people's lives better? Yeah, that's a great question. And there is really a sense in which some of the more like innovative, big for-profit companies just are like doing an incredibly useful thing for the world. They're like providing a service that wouldn't otherwise exist. And people are obviously using it because they are a successful for-profit company. Yeah, so I guess the question is something like, you know, you're stepping back, you're asking, how can I like have a ton of impact with what I do? The question is, are we like underrating just starting a company? So I feel like I want to throw out a bunch of kind of disconnected <laughs> observations. We'll see if they like tie together. There is a reason why you might in general expect a non-profit route to do well. And this is like obviously very naive and simple, but where there is a for-profit opportunity, you should just expect people to kind of take it. Like this is why we don't see $20 bills lying on the sidewalk. But the natural incentives for, uh, in some sense, taking opportunities to like help people where there isn't um, a profit opportunity, they're going to be weaker. And so if you're thinking about the like difference you make compared to whether you do something or whether you don't do it, in general, you might expect that to be bigger where you're doing something non-profit. And like in particular, this is where there isn't a market for a good thing. So it might be because the things you're helping like aren't humans. It might be because they like live in the future, so they can't um, pay for something. It could also be because maybe you want to or get a really impactful technology off the ground. In those cases, you get a kind of free rider dynamic. I think where there's less reason to like where you can't protect the IP and patent something. There's less reason to be the first mover. And so this is like, maybe it's not for profit, but starting a, or helping kind of get a technology off the ground, which could eventually be a space for a bunch of for-profit companies to make a lot of money. 
that seems really exciting. Also creating markets where there aren't markets seems really exciting. So for instance, setting up like AMCs, advanced market commitments um, or prizes, or just giving, yeah, creating incentives where there aren't any. So you get the like efficiency and competition kind of gains that you get from the for-profit space. That seems great. But that's not really answering your question because the question is like, what about actual for-profit companies? I don't know what I have to say here, like in terms of whether they're being underrated. Um, yeah, actually, I'm just curious what, what you think. <laughs> Okay, so I, I I think I have like four different reactions to um, what you said. <laughs> I've been remembering the number four, just in case I'm at three, and I'm like, I think I had another thing to say. Okay, so um, yeah, so I, I, I had a draft, uh, an essay about this that I didn't end up publishing, but we, that led to a lot of interesting discussions between uh, us. So that, that, that's why uh, we might have, uh, I, I don't know, in case the audience feels like they're interrupting a conversation that was already uh, preceded <laughs> the, the beginning here. Uh, so one is that... Um, to what extent should we expect this market to be efficient? So one thing you can think is, listen, the amount of potential startup ideas are so vast and the amount of great founders is so small that mm -hmm. you can have a situation where the the most profitable ideas are, yeah, that, it's right, that like somebody like Elon Musk will come up and like pluck up like all the, maybe like the $100 billion ideas. But if you have like a company like uh, Wave, I'm, I'm sure they're doing really well. But, uh, you know, if, if it's not obvious how it becomes the next Google or something, and I guess more importantly, if it requires a lot of context, for example, you talked about like um, neglected groups. Um, I, I guess this doesn't solve for animals and um, future people. But if you have somebody, something in global health where you're like a neglected group is, for example, people living in Africa, right? Um, it, the people who could be building companies don't necessarily have uh, experience with the problems that these neglected groups have so if you have it's very likely that or i guess it's possible that you could come upon an idea if you were specifically looking at how to help for example you know people suffering from poverty in the world in the the poorest parts of the world you could like identify a problem that just like people who are programmers in silicon valley just wouldn't know about I, okay so a, a bunch of other ideas regarding uh the other things you said one is okay maybe maybe a lot of progress depends on fundamental new technologies and companies coming at the point where the technology is already available and somebody needs to really implement and put all these ideas together. Yeah, two things on that. One is, uh, good, like, we don't need to go in rabbit hole on this. One is the argument that actually the, the invention itself, not, not the invention, the innovation itself is a very important aspect and potentially a bottleneck aspect of this, of getting an invention off the ground and scaled. Another is if you can build a $100 billion company or a trillion dollar company, or maybe not even just like a billion dollar company, you have the resources to actually invest in R&D. I mean, think of a company like Google, right? Like how many billions of dollars have they basically poured down the drain on like hair brain schemes? Um, uh, you, you can have like reactions to DeepMind with regards to AI alignment, but I mean, just like uh, other kinds of research things they've done seem to be like really interesting and uh, really useful. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, all the other fan companies have a, like a program like this, like Microsoft Research or I, I don't know what Amazon's thing is. And then another thing you can point out is with regards to setting up a market that would make other kinds of ideas possible um, and other kinds of businesses possible. Uh, in some sense, you could maybe make the argument that that's that maybe some of the biggest companies, that's exactly what they've done, right? If you think of like Uber, um, it's not a market for companies or maybe, maybe Amazon is a much better example here where, um, you, you know, like you theoretically who had an incentive before, like if a pandemic happens, I'm going to manufacture a lot of masks. Right. But Amazon provides, uh, makes the market so much more liquid so that you can, you can just start manufacturing masks and now immediately put them up on Amazon. So it seems in these ways, actually maybe starting a company is a really, uh, is an effective way to deal with those kinds of problems. Yeah, man, we've gone so async here. I should have just like said one thing and then um, yeah, so I'm sorry for throwing lots of things at you and, um, there's a lot there there's all, as far as I can remember those are all great points um, yeah I think my like high level thought is I'm not sure how much we disagree but I guess one thing I want to say is again thinking about like in general what should you expect the real biggest opportunities to typically be for like just having a kind of impact you know one thing you might think of is if you can optimize for two things separately, that is optimize for the first thing and then use that to optimize for the second thing versus trying to optimize for some like combination of the two at the same time, uh, you might expect to do better if you do the first thing. So for instance, you can do a thing which looks a bit like 
try to do good in the world and also like make a lot of money um like social enterprise and often that goes very well but you can also do a thing which is try to make a lot of money and just just you know make a useful product that is not directly aimed at you know proving humanity's prospects or anything but it's just kind of just great and then use the success of that first thing to then just think squarely like how do i just do the most good um without worrying about whether there's some kind of profit mechanism i think often that strategy is going to pan out well there's this thought about the kind of the tails coming apart if you've had this thought that at the extremes of like either kind of scalability in terms of opportunity to make a lot of profit and at the extreme of doing like a huge amount of goods you might expect expect that to be like not such a strong correlation again one reason like in particular that you might think that is because you might think the like future really matters <laughs> like humanity's future and um sorry to be like a, a stock record but like because there's not really like a natural market there because these people don't haven't been born yet that is like a rambly way of saying that okay that's not always going to be true but i basically just agree that yeah i would want to resist a framing of doing good which just leaves out like also doing some starting some successful for-profit company like there are just a ton of really excellent examples of where that's just been a huge success and yeah should be celebrated um so yeah i think i disagree with the spirit um maybe we disagree somewhat on the like how much we should kind of relatively emphasize these different things but um doesn't seem like a kind of very deep disagreement yeah yeah uh, maybe i've been spending too much time with brian kaplan or something uh, <laughs> um uh, what, what, uh, so by the way the tale is coming apart i think is a, a very interesting um yeah, very interesting way to think about this. Uh, Scott Alexander has a good article on this, and like w one thing he points out is like, yeah, generally you expect like different parts of different types of strength to correlate, but the guy who has the strongest grip strength in the world is probably not the guy who has the biggest squad in the world, right? Yeah. Okay. So that, I think that's a interesting place to leave that idea. Oh, yeah, another thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about was back testing EA. So if you have th these basic ideas of we want to look at problems that are important, neglected, and tractable. And apply them throughout history. So like a thousand years back, uh, 2000 years back, a hundred years back. I is there a context in which applying these ideas um, would maybe lead to a perverse outcome, an un unexpected outcome? Um, and are there examples where, uh, I mean, there, there's many examples in history where things, you, you could have like easily made things much better, but maybe it made it much better than even conventional morality or like present day uh, ideas would have made them. So I'll react to the first part of the question, which, yeah, as I understand that, yeah. it, is something like, can we think about what some kind of effective altruism-like movement, or if these ideas were in the water, like, significantly earlier, whether they might have misfired sometimes, or maybe they might have succeeded in that. In fact, how do we think about that at all? I guess one thing I want to say is that very often the correct decision, ex ante, is a decision which might do really well in, like, some possible outcomes but you might still expect to fail right the kind of mainline outcome is this doesn't really pan out but it's a it's a moonshot and if it goes well it goes really well this is i guess similar to certain kinds of investing where if that's the case then you should expect even if you follow the exact like correct strategy you should expect to look back on the decisions you make uh made rather and uh see a bunch of failures sure. um where failure is you know you just have very little impact and I think it's important not to to kind of resist the temptation to like really kind of negatively update on whether that was the correct mm. strategy because it didn't pan out. And so, I don't know, if something like EA type thinking was in the water and was like thought through very well, yep, I think it would go wrong a bunch of times and that shouldn't be kind of terrible news. When I say go wrong, I mean like not pan out rather than do harm. If it did harm, <laughs> okay, that's like a different thing. Um, I think one thing this points to, by the way, is like you could take it, you could choose to take a strategy which looks something like mini max regret, right? So you have a bunch of options. You can ask about the kind of roughly worst case outcome, um, or just kind of like you know default eh outcome on each option. And one strategy is just like choose the option with the least bad kind of meh case. And if you take the strategy, you should expect to look back on the decisions you make and like not see as many failures so that's one point in favor of it another strategy is just like do the best thing in expectation <laughs> like if i made these decisions constantly what in the long run just ends up like making the world best 
And this looks a lot like just taking the highest EV option. Maybe you don't want to like uh, run the risk of causing harm. So, you know, that's okay to include. And, you know, I happen to think that like that kind of second strategy is very often going to be a lot better. And it's really important not to be misguided by this kind of feature of the mini max regret strategy where you look back and kind of feel a bit better about yourself in many cases, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I mean, if you think about uh, back testing in terms of the, the, the stock, uh, like, uh, you know, models for the stock market, one thing that uh, to analogize this, one thing that uh, tends to happen is that an, a, a strategy of just like trying to maximize returns from a given trade that results very quickly in you going bankrupt because like sooner or later there will be a trade where you lose all your money and so then there's something called the cali criterion where you reserve a big portion of your money and you only bet with a certain part of it which sounds more similar to the minimized regret thing here um unless your expected value includes a possibility that I mean, in this context, that like, you know, like losing all your money is like an existential risk, right? So uh, uh, maybe you like bake into the cake in the definition of expected value, the odds of like losing all your money. Um, yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great, that's a really great point. Like, I guess in some cases you want to take something which looks a bit more like the the Kelly bet. Um, but if you act to your margins, like relatively small margins compared to the kind of pot of resources you have, then I think it often makes sense to take just the do the best thing bet and not worry too much about what's the kind of like, size of the, the Kelly bet. But um, yeah, that's a, it's a great point. And like, I guess a naive version of doing this is just kind of losing your bankroll very quickly because you've like taken two enormous bets and forgotten that um, they might not pan out. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Oh, what did you mean by add to the margins? So if you think that, that there's a kind of a pool of resources from which you're drawing, which is something mm -hmm. like maybe philanthropic funding for the kind of work that you're interested in doing, mm -hmm. and you're only a relatively marginal actor, um, then that's unlike being like an individual investor where mm. you're more sensitive to the risk of just running out of money. And um, when you're more like an individual investor, then you want to like pay attention to what the size of the Kelly bet is. If you're acting at margins, then maybe that is less of like a big consideration. Although it is obviously still a you know very important point. Well, uh, and then, um, I, I, by the way, I, I don't know if you saw my recent blog post about why I think there will be more EA billionaires. Mm -hmm. Yes. I okay, did. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what your reaction to any of the ideas there is, but like my, my claim is that we should expect the total funds dedicated to EA to grow quite quite a lot. Um, yeah, I think I really liked it, by the way. <laughs> I think it was great. One thing it made me think of is that there's quite an important difference between trying to maximize returns for yourself and then trying to get the most returns just like for the world, which is to say just doing the most good where one consideration we've just talked about, which is a risk of just like losing your bankroll, which is where like Kelly betting becomes relevant. Um, another consideration is that as an individual, just like trying to do the best for yourself, you have like pretty steeply diminishing returns from money or just like how well your life goes with that extra money, right? So like if you have like, 10 million in the bank and you make another 10 million, does your life get twice as good? <laughs> Obviously not, right? And as such, you should be kind of risk averse when you're thinking about the possibility of like making a load of money. If on the other hand, you just care about like making the world go well, <laughs> um, then the world's an extremely big place. And so you basically don't run into these diminishing returns like at all. And for that reason, like if you're making money, at least in part to in some sense, give it away or otherwise just like, have a positive effect in some impartial sense, then you're going to be less risk averse, which means maybe um, you fail more often, but it also means that people who succeed, like succeed really hard. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that's, in some sense, I'm just recycling what you said, but um, I think it's like a, yeah, a really kind of neat observation. Well, and another interesting thing is that not only is that true, but then you're also, you're also in a movement where everybody else is, has a similar idea. And not only is that true, but also the movement is full of people who are young, techie, smart, mm -hmm. and as you said, risk neutral. So basically people who are going to be way overrepresented in the, in the ranks of future billionaires. And they're all hanging out and they have this idea that, you know, we can become rich together and then make the world better by doing so. Um, you would expect that this would be the, exactly the kind of situation that would lead to people teaming up and starting billion dollar companies. 
All right. Uh, yeah, so a bunch of other topics in effective altruism that I wanted to ask you about. So one is, should it impact our decisions in any ways if the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is true? I know the argument that, oh, you can just think of, you can just translate amplitudes to probabilities. And if it's just probabilities, then decision theory doesn't change. My problem with this is I, I've gotten like very lucky in the last few months. Now, <laughs> it, it, I think it like changes my perception of that if I realize Actually, most me's, and okay, I know there's like problems with saying me's, to what extent they're fungible. Most branches of the of the multiverse, uh, like I, I'm like significantly worse often. I, that, that makes it worse than, oh, I just got lucky, um, but like now I'm here. <laughs> and another thing is if you think of existential risk um, and do think that it, even if like existential risk is very likely in some branch of the multiverse, humanity survives. I don't know, that, that seems better in the end than, oh, the probability was really low, but like it just resolved to we didn't survive. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. There's, there's a lot there. I guess rather than doing a terrible job at trying to explain what this many worlds thing is about, maybe it's worth just kind of pointing people towards, you know, just Googling it. I, I should also add this enormous caveat that I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is just kind of an outsider who's taken this kind of, I don't know, this, just, this stuff seems interesting. Yeah, okay, so they just, there's this question of like, what, if the many worlds view is true, what, if anything, could that mean uh, with respect to questions about like, what should we do or what's important? And one thing I want to say is, just like without zooming into anything, it just seems like a huge deal. Like, every second, <laughs> every day, I'm in some sense like, just kind of dissolving into this like cloud of me's and like just kind of unimaginably large number of, of me's. And that, each of those me's is kind of in some sense dissolving into more clouds. Um, this is just like wild. Also seems somewhat likely um, to be true as like far as I can tell. Okay, so like, what does this mean? You, yeah, you point out that you can talk about having a measure over worlds. In some sense you can, there's actually a problem of how you get like probabilities or how you make sense of probabilities on the many worlds view. And there's a kind of neat way of doing that, which like makes use of questions about how you should make decisions that is you should just kind of weigh future use according to in some sense how likely they are but it's really the reverse you're like explaining what it means for them to be more likely in terms of how it's rational to weigh them um and then i think it's like a ton of very vague things i can try saying so maybe i'll just try doing a, like a, a, a brain dump of things you might think that like many worlds being true could push you towards being more risk neutral in certain cases if you weren't before um because in certain cases, you're like translating from some chance of this thing happening or it doesn't into some fraction of, you know, worlds, this thing does happen and another fraction it doesn't. That's kind of like, I, I do think it's worth reading too much into that because I think a lot of the like important uncertainties about the world are still like subjective uncertainties about how most worlds will in fact turn out. But it's kind of interesting and notable that you can like convert between overall uncertainty about how things turn out to like more certainty about the fraction of th ways things turn out. <laughs> I think another like interesting feature of this is that, so the question of like how you should act is no longer the question of like, how should you kind of benefit this person who is you in the future, who's one person. It's more like, how do you benefit this like cloud of people who are all success of you? That's just kind of like diffusing into the future and I think you point out that you could just like basically salvage a lot of basically all decision theory, even if that's true. But the like picture of what's going on changes. And in particular, I think just intuitively, like it feels to me like the gap between acting in a self-interested way and then like acting in an impartial way where you're like helping other people, it kind of closes a little in a, in a way. Like you're, you're already benefiting many people by doing the thing that's kind of rational to benefit you. Um, which isn't so far from benefiting people who aren't like continuous with you in this special way. So I kind of like that as a, as a thing. Huh. Um, it's so interesting. Yeah. And then, th okay. There is also this like slightly more out there thought, which is, here's the thing you could say, if many worlds is true. Then there is at least a sense in which there are very, very many more people in the future, uh, compared to the past, uh, like just unimaginably many more. <laughs> And even like the next second from now, there are many more people. So you might think that should like make us have a really steep negative discount rate on the future 
which is to say we should like value future times much more than present times and like in a way which would just kind of it wouldn't like modify how we should act it just like explodes how we should think about this this definitely doesn't seem right <laughs> maybe one way to think about this is that if this thought was true or like was kind of directionally true then that might also be a reason for being extremely surprised that we're both speaking at like an earlier time rather than a later time because if you think you're just like mm -hmm. randomly drawn from all the people <laughs> who ever lived it's like absolutely mind-blowing that we get drawn from like today rather than tomorrow yeah, yeah given yeah. that there's like 10 to the something many more people than tomorrow um so it, it's probably wrong and wrong mm. for reasons i don't have a very good handle on because i just like don't know what i'm talking about i mean i can kind of try parroting the reasons but like it's something i'm you know i'm interested in trying to really crock those reasons a bit more that, that, that that's really interesting um I, I i i didn't think about that argument uh for uh the selection argument i think one resolution i've heard about this is that you can think of the proportion of you know hilbert space or like the proportion of all the the, the, the like the universe's wave function that could be the pro uh, like the probability rather than uh, each different branch. Uh, you know what I just realized the, the selection argument you can ma you made. Maybe that's an argument against Bostrom's um, Bostrom's idea of we're living in a simulation because basically his argument is that there will be many more simulations than there are real mm -hmm. copies of you. Therefore, you're probably in a simulation. The, the like the thing about like saying that all the simulations plus you are your prior should be equally distributed among them seem similar to saying your prior of being distributed along each possible like branch of uh the wave function mm -hmm. should be your prior across of them should be the same mm -hmm. whereas i think um in the context of the wave function you were arguing that maybe it should be like you shouldn't think about it that way you should think about like maybe a proportion of the total uh, wave uh total hilbert space um yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Does, does that make yeah. sense i, I don't wait, know if so, I, I put it wait say it again how how it links into simulation type stuff instead of thinking about each possible simulation as an individual thing uh, across mm. which uh, that is equally as likely each individual instance of a simulation is equally as likely yeah. as you living in the real world maybe simulation as a whole is equally likely to you living in the real world just as you being alive today rather than tomorrow is equally likely, despite the fact that there will be many more branches, uh, mm. new branches of the wave function tomorrow. Yeah, okay, there's, there's a lot, again, a lot going on. I feel like there are people who are like, actually know what they're talking about here, just tearing their hair out, like, you this obvious thing. Um, so you mentioned... <laughs> that's yeah, that's nature of a right? podcast. That's the point. Um, <laughs> you... But by the way, if, if you are one such person, please do, uh, like, email me or DM me or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested. Um, so yeah, you mentioned, like, it is, obviously there is a measure over over worlds and there's like lets you talk about things being sensible again also maybe like one minor thing to comment on is talking about probabilities is kind of hard because every in on many worlds just everything happens that can happen and so it's like difficult to get the language exactly right but anyway so I totally get the point and then it's the question of how it maps on to simulation type thoughts here's a i don't know like a maybe a thought which kind of connects to this um, do you know like sleeping beauty type problems? Um, no, no. Okay, this is only a vaguely remembered example. Um, but let's let's try it. So in the like original sleeping beauty problem, you go to sleep. Okay, and then I flip a coin. Um, or you know, whoever, someone flips a coin. If it comes up tails, they wake you up once. If it comes up heads, they wake you up once, and then they uh, you go back to sleep and, you know, your memory is wiped and then you're woken up again as if you're being woken up uh, in the other world. And, um, okay, so you go to sleep, you wake up and you ask, what is the chance that the coin came up heads or tails? And it feels like there's a kind of really intuitive reasons for both 50% and one third. Here's a related question, which is maybe a bit simpler, at least in my head. I flip a coin, if it comes up heads, I like just make a world with one observer in it. And if it comes up tails, I make a, a world with a hundred observers in it. Maybe it could be like running simulations with a hundred people. You like wake up in one of these worlds. You don't know how many other people are there in the world. You just know that like someone has flipped a coin and decided to make a world with either one or a hundred people in it. What is the chance that you're in the world with a hundred people? And like, there's a reason for thinking it's half. And there's a reason for thinking that it's like, I don't know, a hundred over 101. Does that make sense? 
Uh, so I, I understand the logic behind the half. What is the reason for thinking? I mean, it, regardless of what, where you ended up as the observer, it seems like if the odds of like the coin coming up. Oh, I guess is it because you'd expect there to be more observers in the other universe? Like, wait, I, yeah. So what is the logic for thinking it might be uh, 100 over 100? Well, you might think of it like this. How should I reason about where I am? Well, maybe it's something like this. I'm just a random observer, right? Of all the possible observers that could have come out of this. And there are 101 possible observers. And you can just imagine that I've been like randomly drawn. Okay. And if I'm randomly drawn from all the possible observers, then it's overwhelmingly likely that I'm in the, the big world. Huh. That, that, that's super interesting. Um, I should say, actually, I, I, should, I should plug someone who does know what they're talking about on this, which is Joe Carl Smith, who has like a series of like really excellent <laughs> Uh, blog posts. Oh, um, he's coming on the podcast next week. Yes, amazing. I'm definitely gonna okay, you should ask him about this because he he's like really <laughs> good at talking about it. I don't want to like okay, I don't want to scoop him, but one thought that comes from him, which is just like really cool, maybe just to kind of round this off, is if you're like a 100 over 101 on examples like this, and you think there's any chance that like the universe is infinite in size, then you should think that the chance you're in a universe that is infinite in extent is just like one or close to one uh if that makes sense mm, i see yeah yeah okay so in the end then well, uh, does your awareness of many worlds is like a good explanation has that has that impacted your view of what should be done in any way yeah so i don't really know if i have a good answer my best guess is that things just shake out to kind of where they started as long as you started off in this kind of like relatively risk neutral place I suspect that if many worlds is true, this might have like, this might make it much harder to hold on to kind of intuitive views about personal identity for the reason that like, there isn't this like one person who you're like continuous with throughout time and no other people, which is how people tend to think about what it is to like be a person. And then there's this kind of like vague thing, which is just occasionally I, you know, just like remember like every other month or so that maybe many worlds is true. <laughs> And it just kind of like blows my mind. And I don't, I don't know what to do about it. And I just like go on with my day. <laughs> That's about where I am. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, other interesting topics to uh, talk about. Uh, talent search. What is the what is EA doing about identifying, let's say, more people like you, basically, right? But maybe even like people like you who are not in like places yeah. where they're not next to Oxford. For I, I don't know where you actually are from originally, but um, like I, if they're from like some uh, like I don't know like China or India or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, what what is EA doing to recruit more Finns from uh, from places where they might not otherwise work on EA? Yeah, it's a great question. And yeah, to be clear, I just won the lottery on things going right to kind of um, be lucky enough to do what I'm doing now. So yeah, in some sense, the question is, how do you like print more winning lottery tickets and indeed like find those people who really deserve them, but like just currently not being identified. A lot of this comes from, I, just, I read that book, Talent, um, Tyler Cowen and Daniel mm -hmm. Gross recently. And yeah, there's something really powerful about this fact that this like business of, you know, finding really like smart driven people and connecting them with opportunities to like do the things they really want to do. This is like really kind of still inefficient. <laughs> and there's just still like so many just people out there who like aren't kind of getting those opportunities. I actually don't know if I have much more like kind of insight to add there other than this is just a big deal and it's like there's a sense in which it is an important consideration for this like project of trying to do the most good like you really want to find people who can like put these ideas in practice and i think there's a special premium on that kind of person now given that there's like a lot of philanthropic kind of funding ready to like be deployed there's also a sense in which it is, this is just like in some sense like a cause in its own right it's kind of analogous to open borders in that sense, at least in my mind. I hadn't really like appreciated it in, on some kind of visceral level before I read that book. And then another thing he talks about in the book is you want to get them when they're young. You can really shape somebody's um, ideas about what's worth doing if you have, and then also their ambition about how, what they can do if you catch them early. Um, and, you know, uh, Tyler Khan also had an interesting blog post a while back where he pointed out that a lot of people applying to his Emergent Ventures uh, program a lot of young people flying um, are heavily influenced by effective altruism, which seems very like it's going to be a very important factor in uh, in, the, in the in the long term. I mean, eventually these people will be in positions of power. Yeah, so uh, maybe effective altruism is already succeeding to the extent that 
a lot of the most uh, ambitious people in the world are uh, identified that way, or at least, I mean, g given the selection effect that Tyler Cowen's program has. But yeah, so um, what what is it that can be done to get people when they're young? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. And I think like what you point out there is, is right. There's some, Nick Whittaker has this blog post to something like the, it's called the Lamplight Model of Talent Curation. Mm -hmm. Um and he like draws this distinction between casting um like a very wide net that's just kind of very legibly prestigious and then you know filtering through thousands of of applications or in some sense like putting out the bat signal that in the first instance just like attracts the like really promising people and maybe actually drives away people who would be a better fit for something else um, so like an example is if you were to hypothetically <laughs> write a quite, quite a wonky economics blog, like every day for however many years, and then run some fellowship program, you're just like automatically selecting for people who read that blog. And that's like a pretty good kind of starting population to begin with. So I really like that, that kind of thought of just like not needing to be like incredibly loud and like prestigious sounding but rather just like being quite honest about what the thing is about so you just attract the people who who like really so sort it out because that's just quite a good feature i think another thing that again this is like not a very interesting point to make but something i've really realized the value of is like having physical um hubs and so there's this model of you know running like fellowships for instance where you just like find really promising people and then there's just so much to be said for like putting those people in the same place and, you know, surrounding them with maybe people who are a bit more like senior and just kind of like letting this natural process happen where people just get really excited that there is this like community of people working on stuff that previously you'd just been kind of reading about in your bedroom on like some blogs that like as a source of motivation, I know it's like less tangible than other things, but yeah, just like so, so powerful. And like probably, the, I don't know, one of the reasons I'm like working here maybe. Yeah, um, it, it is one aspect of uh, <laughs> working from home that you don't get that. Um, um, the, regarding the first point, so I think uh, um, what, maybe the, maybe that should update in favor of not doing community outreach and community building. Like maybe that's negative marginal utility because like if I think about, for example, um, my local, so th there was an effective altruism group at my college that I didn't attend. Um, and there's also like an effective altruism group for the city as a whole um, in Austin that I don't attend. Um, and the reason is just because, I don't know, the people who, it, there is some sort of um, adverse selection here where the people who are leading organizations like this are people who couldn't just like, aren't directly doing the things that effective altruism says they might be might consider doing. Um, and are more interested in the social aspects of altruism. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'd, be, I'd be much less impressed with the movement if my first introduction to it was these specific groups that I, like I've had the personal, uh, I've personally interacted with rather than, I don't know, just like hearing Will McCaskill on a podcast. Um, it, it, so that, by the way, the four latter being my first introduction to effective altruism. Yeah, interesting. Um, I feel like I really don't want to like underwrite the job that community builders are doing. I think. In fact, it's turned out to have been like, and still is just like incredibly valuable, especially just looking at the numbers of like what you can achieve as like a group organizer at your university. Like maybe you could just change the course of like more than one person's career over the course of like a year of your time. That's like pretty incredible. But yeah, I guess part of what's going on is that the difference between like going to your like local group or like engaging with stuff online is that you get to kind of choose the stuff you engage with. And like maybe one upshot here is that the like s kind of set of ideas that might get associated with um, EA is like very big and you don't need to buy into all of it or just like be passionate about all of it. Like if this kind of AI stuff just like really seems interesting, but maybe other stuff is just like more peripheral then you know, one, yeah, like this could push towards wanting to have like a, just a specific group for people who are just like, you know, this AI stuff seems cool. Other stuff, not my like, cup of tea um so yeah i mean in the future as like things get scaled up as well as kind of scaling out i think also maybe having this like differentiation and kind of diversification of like 
different groups. I mean, it seems pretty good, but just like more of everything also seems good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm probably overfitting on my own experience, and given the fact that I don't, didn't, uh, didn't actively interact with any of those communities, I'm uh, p probably not even informed on th those experiences of loves. Um, but there was an interesting post on an effective altruism forum that somebody sent me, where they were making the case that um, it, it, at their college as well, they got the sense that uh, the EA community building stuff had the negative impact because people were kind of turned off by their peers and also uh, I, there's a difference between like i don't know somebody like saying baker and Friedel or will mccaskill uh, advising you uh, obviously virtually um to um uh to do these kinds of things versus like i don't know some some sophomore at your university studying philosophy right um <laughs> <laughs> no offense <laughs> um yeah, uh, yeah you I, do, I, mean? I do um i think my guess is that like on net these these efforts are still just like overwhelmingly positive but um yeah, I think it's like pretty interesting that people have the experience you describe as well. Yeah, and interesting to think about ways to kind of like get around that. So long reflection is a, it seems like a bad idea, no? I'm so glad you asked. Um, yeah, I want to say, I want to say no. I think in some sense I've like come around to it as an idea. But yeah, okay, maybe it's worth like. Oh, really interesting. Maybe it's worth, I guess, like trying to explain what's going on sure, with this, yes. this idea. Um <laughs> So if you were, like, were to zoom out like really far over time and consider our place now, like in history, and you could like ask this question about, suppose in some sense, humanity just became like perfectly coordinated. What's the plan? Like what, what kind of in general should we be prioritizing and like in what stages? And um, you might say something like this. It looks like this moment in history, which is to say maybe this century or so, just looks kind of wildly and like unsustainably dangerous, like, or kind of so many things are happening at once. It's really hard to know how things are going to pan out, but it's like possible to imagine things panning out really badly and badly enough to just like more or less end history. Okay, so before we can like worry about some kind of longer term considerations, let's just get our act together and make sure we don't mess things up. So, okay, like that seems like a pretty good first priority. But then, okay, suppose that you succeed in that and like we're in a significantly safer kind of time. Uh, what then? You might notice that the scope for like what we could achieve is like really extraordinarily large, like maybe kind of larger than most people kind of like typically entertain. Like we could just do a ton of really exceptional things, but also this is kind of feature that maybe in the future not and not especially long-term future we might more or less for the first time be able to embark on these like really kind of ambitious projects that are in some important sense uh like really hard to reverse and that might make you think okay at some point it'd be great to like in some like you know achieve our that potential that we have and just like like for instance a kind of lower bound on this is lifting everyone out of poverty who remains in poverty and then like going even further, just making everyone even wealthier, able to do more things that they want to do, making more scientific discoveries, whatever. So we want to do that, but maybe something should come in between these two things, which is like figuring out what is actually good. Um, and okay, why should we think this? I think one thought here is it's very plausible. I guess it's kind of links to what we were talking about earlier, that the way we think about, you know, like, really positive futures like one of the best futures it's just like really kind of incomplete almost certainly we're just getting a bunch of things wrong by this kind of pessimistic induction on the past like a bunch of smart people thought really reprehensible things like 100 years ago so we're getting things wrong and then it's like second thought is i don't know it seems possible to actually make progress here in thinking about what's good there's this kind of interesting point that most like work in, I guess you might call it like moral philosophy has focused on the negatives. So, you know, avoiding doing things wrong, fixing harms, avoiding bad outcomes. But this idea of like studying the positive, or studying like what we should do, if we can kind of do like many different things, this is just like super, super early. And so we should expect to be able to make a ton of progress. And so, okay, again, imagining that the world is like perfectly coordinated, would it be a good idea to like spend some time maybe a long period of time 
kind of deliberately holding back from embarking on these like huge irreversible projects, which maybe involve like leaving Earth in kind of certain you know scenarios, or otherwise just like doing things which are hard to undo. Should we spend some time thinking before then? Yeah, sounds good. And then I guess the very obvious response is, okay, that's a pretty huge assumption um, that we can just like coordinate around that. And I think the answer is, yep, it is. But as a kind of directional ideal, should we push towards or away from the idea of like taking our time, holding our horses, kind of getting people together who haven't really like been part of this like conversation and like hearing them? Yeah, definitely seems worthwhile. Okay, so I have another good abstract idea that I want to entertain by you. So, you know, it, it seems like kind of wasteful that we have these different companies that are building the same exact product. Uh, but, you know, because they're building really the same exact product, they don't have economies of scale and they don't have coordination. There's just a whole bunch of uh, loss that comes from that, right? Wouldn't it be better if we could just coordinate and just like figure out the best person to produce something together and then just have them produce it. And then we could also coordinate to figure out like well, what, what is the right quantity and quality of, for, for them to produce. I'm not trying to say this is, uh, this is like communism or something. I, I'm just saying it, it, it's ignoring what we required. Like in this analogy, you're ignoring like what, what kinds of information gets lost and um, what kinds of, uh, what, what it requires to do that so-called coordination um, in the communism example. Um, in this example, it seems like you're not, uh, uh, it, whatever would be required to prevent somebody from realizing, some, like let's say somebody has a vision for like, we, we want to colonize a star system. We want to like, I don't know, make, make some new technology, right? That That's part of something that the long reflection would curtail. Maybe I'm getting this wrong, but it seems like it would require almost a global panopticon uh, totalitarian straight, uh, state to be able to like prevent people yeah. from escaping um, the reflection. <laughs> okay, so there's a continuum here. And I basically agree that some kind of panopticon-like thing, not only is impossible, but actually sounds pretty bad. <laughs> but something where you're just like pushing in the direction of being more coordinated on the international level about things that matter seems like desirable and possible. Um, and in particular, like preventing really bad things rather than like try to get people to like all do the same thing. Um, so the biological weapons convention just strikes me as an example, which is like imperfect and underfunded, but you know, nonetheless kind of directionally good. And maybe an extra point here is that there's like a sense in which the long reflection option, or I guess the better framing is like, aiming for a bit more reflection rather than less. That's like the conservative option. That's like doing what we've already been doing um, just a bit longer rather than some like radical option. So I, I, you know, I agree. It's like pretty hard to imagine like, you know, some kind of super long period where everyone's like perfectly agreed on, on doing this. Um, but yeah, I think framing it as like a directional ideal seems pretty worthwhile. And I guess, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of naively hopeful about the possibility of coordinating better around things like that. Uh, th there's two reasons why this seems like a bad idea to me. One is, okay, first of all, who is going to be deciding when we've come to a good consensus about, uh, uh, okay, so we've decided like this is the way we, things should go. Um, now we're like ready to escape the long reflection and realize our vision for the rest of the lifespan of the universe. Who is going to be doing that? It's the people who are uh, presumably in charge of the long reflection. It, it, almost by definition, it'll be the people who have an incentive in uh, preserving whatever power, uh, well, a, a power balances exist at the end of the long reflection. And then the second thing you'd ask is like, um, have, uh, th there's like a difference between, I think, uh, having a consensus on not using biological weapons or something like that, where you're limiting a negative versus it seems like when we've had, uh, when we've required society wide consensus on what we should aim towards achieving, um, the outcome has not been good in history. Uh, it, it seems better that on the positive end to just leave it open ended and then just maybe, um, when necessary, say that like the, the very bad things. It, uh, we might want to restrict together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I kind of just agree with a lot of what you said. So I think the best like framing of this is the version where when you're preventing something, which most people can agree is negative, which is to say some actor unilaterally deciding to like do this huge irreversible or set out on this huge irreversible project. Like something you said was that the outcome is going to reflect the 
like values of whoever is like in charge. Um, and not, not just the values. I mean, it also, I, I mean, just like think about how guilds work, right? It's like um, if, if the it, whenever we, for example, in industry, we let how the industry should progress. We let those kinds of decisions be made collectively by the people who are currently dominant in the industry um uh you know gills or something like that um or um or like a, a, a industrial conspiracies uh a, a, as well it seems like the outcome is um uh outcome is just uh bad like uh, and so like my prior <laughs> would be that at the end of such a situation our ideas about what we should do would actually be worse than uh, going into the long reflection i, I mean obviously uh the uh, it really depends on how it's implemented, right? So I'm not saying that, but uh, just uh, just like uh, broadly, given all possible implementations, and maybe the most likely implementation, given how governments run now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say that, like, I am in fact like pretty uncertain. I just kind of, I don't know it's more more enjoyable to like give this thing its hearing. No, no, I, I one... enjoy the uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. parts where we have disagreements. Yeah. So one thought here is if you're worried about the future like the course of the future being determined by some single actor i mean that that worry is just symmetrical with the worry of letting whoever wins some race first go and do you know go and do the thing the like project where they more or less kind of determine what happens to the rest of humanity so the option where you like kind of deliberately wait and let people like have some uh like global conversation I don't know, it seems like that is less worrying, even if the worry is still there. I should also say, I can imagine the outcome is not unanimity. In fact, it'd be like pretty wild if it was, right? But you want the outcome to be some kind of like stable, friendly disagreement where now we can kind of like maybe reach some kind of cozy solution and we just like go and do our own things. There's like a bunch of projects which kind of go off at once. Um, I don't know, that feels like really great to me compared to whoever gets there first determining how things turn out but yeah i mean it's it's hard to talk about stuff right because it's like somewhat speculative but um i think it's just like a useful like north star or something to try pointing towards um uh, okay so maybe but to make it more concrete I, I wonder if your uh if your expectation that the the consensus view uh would be better than the first mover view uh let's in like today's world maybe okay either we Either we have the form of government uh, and uh, not just government, but yet also the the I mean, the industrial and logistical organization that I don't know, like Elon Musk has designed for Mars, either that is so if he's the first mover for Mars, would you prefer that or we have the UN uh, come to a consensus between all the different countries uh, about like how we should have the first Mars colony organized or should would, it, would, would the Mars colony run better if after like 10, 20 years of that, th th they're the ones who decide how the first Mar Mars colony goes? global consensus views to be better than first mover views yeah that's a good question and i mean one obvious point is not always right like there are certainly cases where the consensus view is just like somewhat worse um i think you limit the downside with the consensus view right because you give people space to express why they just don't think this like one idea is is bad i don't know if this is not your question but like it's a really good one the, like you can imagine the kind of the un led thing is going to be like way slower it's going to probably be way more expensive. The International Space Station is a good example where, um, I don't know, I think that turned out pretty pretty well, but a like private version of that would have happened like in some sense a lot more effectively. I guess I'm not, like the Elon example is is kind of a good one because it's not obvious why that's like super worrying. The thing I have in mind in the like long reflection example is maybe like a bit more kind of wild, um, but it's like really hard to make it concrete. So I'm, yeah, somewhat floundering. There's there's also another reason to like um to the extent that somebody has the resources I I don't know maybe this like just gets to an irreconcilable um question about your priors about uh, other kinds of political things but um to the extent that somebody has been able to build up resources uh, privately to be able to be a first mover in a way that is going to matter for the long term what do you think about uh, what kind of views they're likely to have and what kind of competencies they're likely to have versus Assuming that the way governments work and function and the quality of their government governance doesn't change that much for the next hundred years, what what kind of outcomes you will have from 
I, I, basically, if you if you think like the likelihood of leaders like Donald Trump or Joe Biden is like going to be similar for the, like the next hundred years, and if you think like the richest people in the world or the first movers are going to be people that are similar to Elon Musk, I, I can see people having like genuinely different uh, reasonable views about who should like uh, the. Should the Elon Musk of 100 years from now or the Joe Biden of 100 years from now have the power to decide the long run course of humanity? Is that a fulcrum in this debate that you think is important or is that maybe is that not as relevant as I might think? Yeah, I guess I'll try saying some things and maybe we'll like respond to that. Kind of two things are going through my head. So one is something like you should expect these questions about like what should we do when we have the capacity to do like a far larger range of things than we currently have the capacity to do that question is going to hinge like much more importantly on like theories people have and like worldviews and very kind of particular details much more than it does now. And I'm going to do a bad job at trying to articulate this, but there's some kind of analogy here where if you're like fitting a curve to some points, you can like overfit it. And in fact, you can overfit it in various ways and they all look pretty similar. But then if you like extend the axis so you like see what happens to the curves like beyond the points, those different ways of fitting it can like go all over the place. And so like there's some analogy here where when you kind of expand the pos- like the space of what we could possibly do, um, different views which look kind of similar right now or at least come to similar conclusions, they just like go all over the shop. And so that is not responding to your point, but I think it's like maybe worth saying like this is a reason for expecting, reflecting on what the right view is to be quite important. And like, and then I guess that leads into a second thought, which is something like, I guess there's two things going on. One is the thing you mentioned, which is there are basically just a bunch of political dynamics where you can just like reason about where you should expect values to head for like political reasons. In some sense, is like now better than the default. And what is that default? <laughs> and then there's a, like a kind of different way of thinking about things, which is like separately from political dynamics, can we actually make progress in like thinking better about what's best to do in the same way that we can like make progress in science, like kind of separately from the fact that like people's views about science are influenced by like political dynamics. And maybe like a disagreement here is a disagreement about like how much scope there is to just get better at thinking about these things. I mean, one like reason I can give, I guess I kind of mentioned this earlier is this project here of like thinking about what's best to do maybe kind of thinking better about ethics is not the thing it's like maybe more relevant to think that this is like on the order of kind of 30 years old rather than on the order of 2000 years old you might call it like secular ethics Parfit writes about this right he's like talks about this kind of there are at least reasons for hope um we haven't ruled out that we can make not make a lot of progress because the thing we were doing before like we were trying to think systematically about what's best to do was just very unlike the thing that we should be interested in. I'm sorry that was like a huge ramble, but hopefully there's something there. Yeah, I, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about how um, you can th- you think you can think of uh, a, I, I don't know a global consensus as the reduced variance version of future views. And you know, so I, I think that like to the extent that you think a downside is really bad, um, I think that's a that's a good argument. Um, and then yeah, it, I mean it's like similar to my argument against like uh, monarchists, which is that like. Actually, I think it is reasonable to expect that if you could like reasonable, uh, you could uh, reliably have people like Lee Kuan Yew who are in charge of your country, and you have a monarchy, that things might be better than a democracy. It's just that the the bad outcome is just so bad that it's like better just having like a low variance uh, thing like democracy. It's if I want to talk about maybe one last kind of trailing thought on what you said is, um, I think, I guess Popper has this thought, and also David Deutsch like did a really good job at kind of explaining it about one like underrated value of democracy is not just in some sense having this function to like combine people's views into like some kind of you know optimal path which is like some mishmash of what everyone thinks it's also like having the ability for um people who are being governed to just like cancel this current experiment in governance and try again so it's some you know it's like we'll give you freedom to you know implement this kind of governance plan that seems really exciting and then we're just going to like pull the brakes when it, when it goes wrong and that kind of the option to like start again in general just feels like really important as some kind of tool you want in your like toolkit when you're thinking about these like pretty big futures i guess my hesitation about this is i i can't imagine us like any a form of government where 
at the end of it, I would expect that a consensus view from, I mean, not just like uh, nerdy communities like EA, but like an actual global consensus would be something that I think is uh, a good path. Maybe to, maybe it's something like I don't think it's like the worst possible path. But I mean, well, one thing about reducing variance is like if you think the far future could be really, really good, then by reducing variance, you're like cutting out, off a lot of expected value, right? Um, and then you, you can think of like democracy works b much better in cases where the problem is like closer to something that the people can experience. It's like, I don't know if the if democracies don't have famines because it's like if there's a famine, you get voted out, right? Uh, or like you have major wars as well, right? But um, if you're talking about like a, a uh, some form of uh, consensus way of deciding uh, what should the far, far future look like, it's not clear to me why uh, the consensus view on that would be, is likely to be correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe some of what's going on here is I'd want to resist the, and it's my fault for, I think, like <laughs> suggesting this framing that is like, you just, you spend a bunch of time thinking and like having this conversation and then you take this like international vote on what we should do. Um, and I think maybe another framing is something like, let's just give the time for the people who like want to be involved in this to like make the progress that could be possible on thinking about these things and then just like see where we end up where I don't know there's like a very weak analogy to progress in like other fields where we don't make progress in like uh mathematics or science by like taking enormous votes on what's true um but we can by just like giving people who are interested in making progress the space and time to do that and then at the end it's like often pretty obvious what turns out that's like very begging the question because it's like way more obvious um what's right and wrong if you're like doing maths compared to doing this kind of thing but um I no but also like what what happens if you, uh, this seems similar to like the question about uh monarchy where it's like what, what happens if you pick the wrong person or the, like the wrong politburo to, to pick what the what what the what the charter you take to the rest of the universe is yeah it seems like a hard problem to ensure that you have uh, the, the group of people who will be deciding this E e either if it's a consensus or if it's a single person or anything in between like it has to be some decision maker right um i think you could just imagine there being no decision maker right so like the thing could be let's agree to have some time to reflect on what is best and we might come to some oh. and then at the end like you know one version of this is just let things happen like there's no final decision when someone I walks see. up it's just like that time between doing the thing and thinking about it just like extending that time for a bit seems good I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, sorry, I missed that uh, earlier. Right. Okay. Uh, so actually, well, one of the major things we were going to discuss. This is like one. All the things we discussed so far was one like quadrant <laughs> of <laughs> like uh, of the conversation. Actually, you know, before we talk about space governance, let's talk about uh, podcasting. So you have your own podcast. Um, I, I have my own. What have you? Uh, what, why did you start it? And like, what, what have you? What, what have you been your like experiences so far? What, what have you learned about the the joy and impact of podcasting? So story is uh, Luca, who's a close friend of mine, who I do this podcast with. We're both at university together, and we're like both podcast nerds. And I think I remember we were in our last year, and we had this conversation like we're like surrounded by all these people who just seem like incredibly interesting. Like all these, you know, like academics we really love to talk about um, or talk to. And if we just like emailed them saying we're doing a podcast and wanted to interview them, that could be a pretty good excuse to talk to them. So let's see how easy it is to do this. Turns out the startup costs on doing a podcast are like pretty low if you want to do like a scrappy version of it, right? Did that. It turns out that like, academics especially but just like tons of people really love being asked to talk about the things they think about all the all day right it's like a complete win-win where you're like you're trying to boost the ideas of someone or some actual person um who you think deserves more airtime. time that person gets to like talk about their work and you know spread their ideas so it's like huh there's like no downsides to doing this other than the time also i should say that the kind of yes rate on our emails was like considerably higher than we thought we were you know like two random undergrads with microphones <laughs> um but there's this really nice like kind of snowball effect where if someone who is like well known is like gracious enough to say yes despite <laughs> knowing not really knowing knowing what you're about and then you do an interview and then, like it's a pretty good interview when you're emailing the next person you don't have to like sell yourself you can just be like hey i spoke to this other impressive person um and of course you get this like 
this kind of snowball. So, uh, no, it, it's definitely a Ponzi scheme. It's great. <laughs> it's like the best kind of Ponzi scheme, though. Podcasts as like a form of media are just like incredibly special. Um, there's something about just the incentives between like guest and host just like aligned so much better than like I don't know if this was like some journalistic interview it'd be like way kind of more uncomfortable there's something about the fact that it's still kind of hard to like search transcripts so there's less of a worry about like forming all your words in the right way so it's just like more relaxed <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah recommend it yeah no it's it's and it's um it, it's such a natural form of uh, you can think of writing as a sort of way of imitating conversation and audiobooks is a way of trying to imitate like a thing that's trying to imitate conversation you're like audiobooks seem like they're supposed to because like you, you get the writing is like yeah you're visually perceiving uh what, what was originally uh, uh um an ability you had originally for understanding uh you know um uh, uh you know audible ideas um but then uh, audiobooks it's like you're, you're going through two layers of translation there where you don't have the natural repetition and the ability to gauge the other person's reaction uh, and so on that um and the back and forth obviously that uh, a national conversation has and um yeah so it, that, that that's why it's like people um potentially listen to like podcasts too much where i don't know that they're, they're just like uh, they have something in their ears the, the whole day which you can't imagine for like yeah, audiobooks yeah, totally. right yeah a few things this makes me think of one is there's some experiment where i guess you can just do it yourself when if you force people not to use disfluences disfluencies sorry like ums and ahs, those people just get like much worse at uh, reading <laughs> words. Uh, in some sense, like disfluencies like help us, I guess I'm using the word like right now, communicate thoughts for some reason. And then if you take yeah, a yeah. podcast I totally like this, I, I guess I can speak for myself. And then you word for word transcribe what you're saying. Or when I say you, I mean me. Um, it's like hot garbage. It's like I've just learned how to talk yes um but that that <laughs> pattern of speech like you point out is in fact easier to to digest or at least it's, it requires less kind of stamina or effort no yeah then the seems to have an interesting point about this um in um anti-fragile i'm vaguely remembering this but he makes a point that um so sometimes when a signal is distorted in some way it makes it you retain or absorb more of it because you have to go through extra effort to understand it which is which is a reason for example i think his example was if um if i, I don't know if somebody is like speaking but they're, they're like far away or something so their audio is muted you you had to like apply more concentration which makes it um which makes it actually which means you more retain more of their content so if you like overlay what someone says with a bit of noise or you turn on the volume very often people have yeah. like better comprehension of it because because of the thing you just wow. say which is like you're paying more attention also i think maybe i was misremembering the Thing i mentioned earlier or maybe it's a different thing which is you can like take perfect speech like recordings and then you can like insert ums and ahs and like make it worse and then you can do like a comprehension test where people listen to the different versions wow. and like, kind of remember it and they do better with the versions which are like less perfect um is, is it just about having more space between uh words like or is it actually the um like if you just added space instead of ums would that have the same effect or is that some, is there something specific about and there's a limit to how much the, 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 i can um stretch is like some global psychology <laughs> course uh, <laughs> um is some global consonant that of, of just like it's like ohm or something yeah, yeah, it like yeah. evokes it evokes like absolute concentration <laughs> yeah exactly um i'm curious to ask you like i know i want to know what you feel like you've learned from doing podcasting so i don't know what maybe one question here is like yeah what's some kind of underappreciated difficulty of uh trying to ask good questions i mean you're like obviously you are currently asking excellent questions so what, what have you learned that um well, we, well, one thing you um i think i've heard this advice that you want to do something where a, a thing that seems um easier to you is difficult for other people like i have tried okay so one obvious thing you can do is like ask on twitter hey i'm interviewing this person what should i ask them and you'll observe that all the end like all the questions that people will, like propose are like terrible um and um so but but maybe it's just like oh yeah there's just the, there's adverse selection the people who actually could come up with good questions are not going to spend the time to like reply to your tweet mm -hmm. um but then i've even like um hopefully they're not listening but i've i've even like tried to like hire like i don't know research partners or research assistants who can help me come up with questions more recently 
And the questions they come up with also seem um, like it just left like, uh, you know, how did growing up in the Midwest like change your views about yeah. blah, blah, blah. It, it just like, I, 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 it's just a question that's uh, whose answer is not interesting. It's not a question you would organically have if you, uh, at least I, hope, when you, I yeah. hope you wouldn't have organically want to ask them if you were only talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. So um, it, it does seem like the skill is um, harder than I would have. Uh, it's rarer than I would have expected. I don't know why. I don't know if you have a good sense of because you you have an excellent podcast where you ask good questions. Uh, I, I I don't know what do you think. It, have you observed this where I, I, the 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 asking good questions is a rarer skill than you might think? Certainly, I've observed that it's a really hard skill. I still feel like kind of I still feel like feel like it's really difficult. I also at least like to think that we've got a bit better. First thing I thought there was this example you gave of like. What was it like growing up in the Midwest? We always ask those kinds of questions. So, you know, like, how did you get into behavioral economics? And why do you think it was so important? These are just like guaranteed to be kind of uninspiring answers. So specificity seems like a really good, or like kind of- What, 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 what is your book about? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, tell us about yourself. Um, this is why I love conversations with Tyler. It's one of the many reasons I love it is yeah. he'll just like launch with, you know, like the first question will be like, about some footnote in this person's like undergrad dissertation <laughs> and that just sets the tone so well um also i think cutting off which i've made very difficult for you i guess cutting off answers what is the interesting thing has been said and the elaboration or like the um caveats on the like meat of the answer are often just like way less worth hearing I think uh, trying to ask questions which a person has no hope of knowing the answer to, even though it'd be great if they knew the answer to, like, so what should we do about this policy <laughs> is a pretty bad move. Also, um, if you speak to people who are like familiar with asking questions about like their book, for instance, in some sense, you need to like flush out the kind of pre-prepared like spiel that they have in their heads. Um, mm. Like, in, I don't know, you could even just do this like before the interview, right? And then like it gets to the good stuff where they're actually being made to think about things. Rob Wiblin has a really good um, like list of interview tips, which I think, I don't know, I guess the reason this is kind of nice to talk about other than the fact this is like good to have some kind of like inside baseball talk is that, you know, like skills of interviewing feel pretty transferable to just asking people good questions, which is like a generally useful skill, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I found that it's like really difficult I still get pretty frustrated with how hard it is, but um, it's just like a cool thing to yeah. realize that you are able to like kind of slowly learn. Yeah. So okay. So what what is how do you think about the value you're adding through your podcast, and then what what advice do you have for somebody who might want to start their own? Yeah. So I know kind of one reason you might think podcasts are really useful in general is. I guess the way I think about this is like, you can imagine there's a kind of just stock of like ideas that seem really important. Like if you just have a conversation with, I don't know, someone who's like researching some cool topic and they tell you all this cool stuff that's just like, isn't, isn't written up anywhere. And you're like, oh my God, uh, this needs to like kind of exist in the world. I think in many cases, this like stock of important ideas just grows faster than it's able, you're able to like, in some sense, pay it down and like put it out into the world. Um, and that's just a bad thing. So there's this overhang you want to fix. And then you can ask this question of, okay, what's the, just like the most, one of the most effective ways to like communicate ideas um, relatively well, put them out into the world. Well, I don't know, just like having a conversation with that person is just like one of the most kind of efficient ways of doing it. I think it's like interesting in general to consider like the kind of rate of information transfer for different kinds of like media and stuff, like transmitting and receiving ideas. So like on the like best end of the spectrum, right? I'm sure you've had kind of conversations where you, everyone you're talking with like shares a lot of context. And so you can just kind of blurt out this like slightly incoherent three minute, like I just had this kind of thought in the shower and they can fill in the gaps and basically just like get the idea. And then at the kind of opposite end, like maybe you want to write a, an article, like a kind of prestigious outlet. And so you're like kind of covering all your bases and making it like really well written. And then just like the information per kind of effort is just like so much lower. And I guess like academic, certain kinds of academic papers are like way out on the, the other side. So yeah, just like as a way of solving this kind of problem of there's this overhang of important ideas, podcasts just seem like a really kind of good way to 
to do that. I guess when you don't successfully put ideas out into the world, you get these little kind of like clusters or like fogs of uh, like contextual knowledge where everyone knows these ideas in the right circles, but they're hard to pick up from like legible sources. And, and it's like kind of maps onto this idea of like context being that thing, which is scarce. I remember like Tyler Cohen talking about that, like kind of like eventually made sense in that context. I will mention that, um, um, it, it seems like kind of, a uh, the, the, the thing you mentioned about either just ha- uh, head off on a podcast and explain your idea or, you know, take the time to, uh, do it in like a prestigious place. It seems mm-hmm. very much like a yeah, Barbell yeah, strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Whereas the middle ground of spending like four or five hours writing a blog post where it's not going to be in some place super prestigious, you might as well just like either just put it up in a podcast if it's the thing you just want to get over with or, you know, uh, spend some time, spend a little bit more time getting in a more prestigious place. The argument against it, I guess, is that it, it, the, the idea seems more accessible if it's in the form of a blog post for, I don't know, for posterity, if you just... Uh, want that to be like the canonical source uh, for something. But again, if you want it to be the canonical source, you should just make it a, a, a sort of like more official thing. Because if it's just a YouTube clip, uh, then it's it's a, it's a little difficult for people to like reference to it. And, you can kind of get the know, best of both so worlds. So you can put your recording into like, there are, you know, the software that transcribes your podcast, right? You can put it into that. If you're lucky enough to have someone to help you with this, you can get someone, or you can just do it yourself, like go through the podcast, the transcript to make sure it's kind of, there aren't any like glaring mistakes and now you have this like artifact that is in text form that like lives on the internet and it's just like way cheaper than writing it in the first place but yeah that's, that's a great point and also people should read your uh barbells for life is that it Barbell strategies for life yeah yeah that's it yeah cool maybe one last thing that seems worth saying on this topic of uh podcasting is like it's quite easy to just start doing a podcast and um my guess is it's often worth at least trying right so i don't know i guess there are probably a few people listening to this who've like kind of entertained the idea uh one thing to say is it doesn't need to be the case that if you just like stop doing it and it doesn't really pan out after like five episodes or even fewer that it's a failure like you can frame it as i wanted to make like a small series that's just like a useful artifact to have in the world which is like i don't know here's this kind of bit of history that i think is underrated i'm gonna tell the story in like four different hour-long episodes if you like set out to do that then you have this like self-contained chunk of work uh, so yeah, maybe that's like a useful framing and there's a bunch of resources, which I'm sure it might be possible to link to on just like how to set up a podcast. I like tried writing, like collecting some of those resources. The thing to emphasize, I think, is that you, I, I, I think I've talked to like at least, I don't know, three or four people at this point who have told me like, oh, I have this idea for a podcast. Um, it's going to be about, you know, like architecture. It's going to be about like VR or whatever. It's, they seem like good ideas. I'm not, I'm not making fun of the ideas themselves. I, but I, I just like, I, I talk to them like six months later and it's like, they, they, they haven't started it yet. And I, I, I just tell them like, literally just email somebody right now, wh- whoever you want me to be your first guest. I mean, I cold emailed uh, Brian Kaplan and he ended up being my first guest. Um, yeah. just email them and like set something on the calendar because I, I don't know what it is. Maybe yeah. just about life in general. I don't know if it's specific to podcasting, but the amount of people I've talked to who have like vague plans of starting a podcast and have nothing scheduled, uh, or like no immediate, <laughs> like they, I, I don't know what they're, they're expecting like some MP3 file to appear on their hard drive on some fine day. Um, uh, so I, I, yeah, but yeah, just do it. Like I get it on the calendar now. <laughs> Yeah, that seems that seems good. Also, there's like some way of thinking about this where you could just like, if you just write off in advance that your first, I don't know, let's say seven episodes are just gonna be like embarrassing to listen to. Um, that is more freeing because it probably is the case. Um, but you like need to go through the like the bad episodes before you start getting good at anything. I guess it's like not even the podcast point. Um, yeah, also there's if you're just like brief and polite there's like very little cost in being ambitious with the people you reach out to that, um so yeah just go for it right the, there brad had this interesting uh he wrote an interesting argument about this somewhere where he was pointing out that actually the cost of cold emailing are much lower if you're like an unknown quantity than if you are like somebody who's like has somewhat mm-hmm. of a reputation because if you if you're just nobody then they're gonna forget you ever cold email them right they're just gonna ignore it in their inbox if you <laughs> ever run into them in the future they're yeah. just gonna like not gonna register have registered you the first time if you're like somebody who has like yeah. somewhat of a reputation then there's like a mystery of like why are we not getting introduced to somebody 
who should know both of us, right? If you claim to be, I don't know, mm-hmm. like a professor who wants to start a podcast. Um, um, I, yeah, but anyways, it, 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 just reinforcing the point that the cost is really low. All right, cool. Okay, uh, let's talk about space, space governance. So this is an area where you've uh, you've been writing about and researching uh, recently. Okay, uh, w- one concern uh, uh, you might have is, you know, that Toby Horta has that book uh, book about the t- uh, the precipice, about how we're in this time of peril, um, where we have like a one in six odds of going extinct this century. Is there some reason to think that once we get to space, this will no longer be a problem, or the the, the risk of extinction for humanity go uh, you, you know asymptote to zero? I think one point here. So actually, maybe it's worth beginning with a kind of like naive case for thinking that like spreading through space is just like the ultimate hedge against extinction. Um, and this is you know you can imagine just like duplicating civilization or at least having kind of civilizational backup like things which are like in different places in space if the risk of any one of them like being hit by an asteroid or like otherwise encountering some existential catastrophe if those risks are independent then you get this like it's exponent it's like a power law with every new um backup right it's like it's like having multiple kind of backups of some some data in different places in the world right so if those risks are independent yes. then it is in fact the case that like going to space is just like incredibly good strategy i think they're pretty compelling reasons to think that a lot of the most worrying risks are uh, like really not independent at all um so uh one example is you can imagine very dangerous pathogens if there's any travel between these places then they, the pathogens are going to travel um but like maybe the more pertinent example is if you think it's worth being worried about artificial general intelligence that is like unaligned that goes wrong and like really relentlessly pursues really terrible goals then just having some like some just physical space between two different places is really not going to work as a real kind of uh hedge so i'd say something like you know space seems kind of it seems net useful to like diversify go to different places but like absolutely not sufficient for like getting through this kind of time of perils then yeah i guess there's kind of this follow-up question which is like okay well why expect that there is any hope of like getting the the risk down to sustainable levels if you're sympathetic to the possibility of like really just transformative artificial general intelligence like arriving you might think that in some sense getting that transition right where the outcome is that now you have this thing on your side which like has your interests in mind or has like good values in mind but has this like general purpose kind of reasoning capability that in some sense, this just like tilts you towards being safe, just like indefinitely long. And one reason is if bad things pop up, like some unaligned thing, then you have this much better established safe and aligned thing, which has this kind of defensive advantage. So that's one consideration. And then if you're like less sympathetic to this AI story, I think you could also just tell a story um, about like being optimistic for our kind of capacity to like catch up along some kind of wisdom or coordination dimension. If you like really zoom out and look at how like quickly we just in- invented all this like kind of insane technology, that is like a roughly kind of exponential process. You might think that that might kind of eventually like slow down, but our like improvements and just how well we're able to coordinate ourselves like continues to increase and so that you get this like defensive advantage in the long run those are two pretty weak arguments so i think it's like actually just a very good question to think about and that i i like you know also kind of acknowledge it's like not a very kind of compelling uh answer I, I, i'm wondering if there are aspects that you can discern from first principles about the safety of space um, which suggests that either, I don't know, either there's no good reason to think the time of perils ever ends. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, cause, cause the thing about AI is like, that's true whether you go to space or not. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. um, if it's aligned, then I guess it can indefinitely reduce existential risk. Mm-hmm. I mean, one thought you can have is maybe, I, I don't know, contra the long reflection th- thing we're talking about, which is that if you would think that one of the bottlenecks to, a great future could be, um, I don't know, like some sort of tyrannical um, 
a, a tyrannical is like a kind of a coded term in terms of like sure. conventional yeah, yeah. Uh, political yeah. thought, but uh, you know what I mean. Then the diversity of political models that being spread out would have, uh, maybe that's a positive thing. Um, on the other hand, uh, Gwern has this interesting blog post about um, about space wars where he points out that the logic of a mutually assured destruction goes away in space, so maybe we should expect more conflict because it's hard to identify who the culprit is if like an asteroid was redirected to your planet and you know if they can speed it up sufficiently fast they can like basically destroy your above ground civilization um yeah so i mean is there something we can discern from first principles about how violent and how how, i don't know how 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 pleasant uh time and space will be um yeah it's a really good question i will say that i think I have not like reflected on that question enough to like give a really <laughs> authoritative answer. Incidentally, one person who absolutely has is um, Anders Sandberg, who has been thinking about almost exactly these questions for a very long time, and in some point in the future might have a have a book about this. So um, um, watch that space. One consideration is that you can start at the end. You can consider what happens very far out in the future. And it turns out that because uh, the universe is expanding for any just like point in space, so if you just like consider the next like cluster over or maybe even the next galaxy over, there'll be a time in the future where it's impossible to reach that other point in space, no matter how long you have to, to get there. So even if you sent out like a signal in the form of light, it would never reach there because there'll always be a time in the future where you start expanding faster than the speed of light relative to that other place. So, okay, like there's a small consolation there, which is if, if you last long enough to get to this kind of era of isolation, then suddenly you become independent again in the like strict sense. I don't think that's especially relevant when we're considering kind of more, I guess, I guess relatively speaking, nearer term things. Um, Gwen's point is really nice. So Gwen starts by pointing out that we have this like logic with nuclear weapons on Earth or mutually assured des destruction where the emphasis is on a second strike. So if... I receive a first strike from someone else. I can identify the someone else that first strike came from and I can kind of like credibly commit to retaliating. Um, and the thought is that this like disincentivizes that person from launching the first strike in the first place, which like makes a ton of sense. Uh, Gwen's point, I guess the thing you already mentioned is in space, there are reasons for thinking it's going to be much harder to like attribute where a strike came from that means that you don't have like any kind of credible way to threaten a retaliation. And so mutually assured destruction doesn't work. And that's kind of like actually a bit of an uncomfortable thought because the alternative to mutually assured destruction in some sense is just first strike, which is if you're worried about some other actor being powerful enough to destroy you, then you should destroy their capacity to destroy you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like it's slightly bleak blog post i think there are like a ton of other, other considerations but some of which are a bit more hopeful ones that you might imagine as in general a kind of like defensive advantage in space over offensive one reason is that space is uh this like dark canvas in 3d where there's absolutely nowhere to hide and so you can't sneak up on anyone um but yeah i think there's like a lot of there's a lot of stuff to say here and a lot of a lot of it i don't quite fully understand yet uh, but, but, but i guess that makes it uh that makes it an interesting and important place to be a uh, subject to be studying if we, we uh we don't know that much about how it's going to turn out so um von neumann has this vision that you would have you would have set up a sort of virus like probe that infests a planet and uses up its usable resources to build more probes which go on and infect more planets is uh, is the long run future of the universe that the all the available low hanging resources are burnt up in, uh, you know, some sort of like fire, uh, you know, expanding fire of von Neumann probes? Because it seems like as long as one person decides that this is something they want to do, then you know, yeah, the the, the low hanging fruit in terms of uh, spreading out will just be burned up by somebody who built something like this. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, okay, maybe there's like an analogy here where we have on Earth, we have organisms which can like convert raw resources plus sunlight into more of them and they replicate. It's notable that they don't like blanket the Earth. 
Although I do just as a tangent, I remember someone mentioned this is thought of like an alien, you know, arrived on Earth and, and asked the question of what is the most successful species? It would probably be grass. But okay, the the reason that like particular organisms that just reproduce using sunlight don't just kind of have this like green goo uh, dynamic is because there are competing organisms. There are things like, you know, antivirals and so on. Um, so I guess, like you mentioned, it's not as if as soon as this thing gets seeded, it's game over. You can imagine trying to catch up with these things and stop them. And I don't know, what's the equilibrium here where you have things that are trying to catch things and things which are also spreading? It's like pretty unclear, but it's not clear that it's everything gets burned down. Although I know it seems like worth having on the table as a possible outcome. And then another thought is, I guess, something you also like basically mentioned. Robin Hansen has this paper called, I think, um, Burning the Cosmic Commons. I think the things he says are like a little bit subtle but i guess to kind of like bastardize the overall point there's an idea that you should expect kind of selection effects on what you observe in the long run of like which kinds of things have won out and this kind of like race for different parts of space and in particular the things you should expect to win out are these things which like burn resources very fast and are like greedy in terms of grabbing um as much space as possible and I don't know, that seems like roughly correct. He also has a more recent bit of work called Grabby Aliens. I think there's a website, grabbyaliens.com, which kind of expands on this point and asks this question about what well, you know, we should expect to see such um, kind of yeah, grabby civilizations. Um, yeah, I mean, one, maybe kind of one like slightly fanciful upshot here is you don't want this like greedy von Neumann type probes to win out, but also just like, dead they have no kind of nothing of value um and so if you think you have something of value to spread maybe you, that is a reason to spread um more quickly than you otherwise like would have planned once you've like figured out what that thing is does that make sense yeah so then th does this militate um uh, it, towards the logic of a space race where similar to the first strike where if, if you're not sure that you can retaliate you want to do a first strike maybe there's a logic to as long as you have like at least somewhat of a compelling vision of what the far future should look like you should try to make sure it's you who's the first actor that goes out into space, even if you don't have everything sorted out, even if you have like concerns about how, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like you'd ideally like to spend more time. My guess is that the timescales on which these dynamics are relevant are like extremely long timescales compared to what we're familiar with. So I don't think that any of this like straightforwardly translates into, you know, wanting to speed up on the order of decades. And in fact, if any like delay on the order of decades, I don't know, presumably or also centuries, gives you like a marginal improvement in your like long run speed, then just because of the like again the timescales and the distances involved, you almost always want to take that trade off. So yeah, I guess I'd want to, I'd be wary of like reading too much into all this stuff in terms of like what we should expect for some kind of race in the near term. It just turns out the space is like extremely big and there's like a ton of stuff there, so. In in anything like the the near term, I think this reasoning about like oh we'll run out of useful resources probably won't kick in. But that's like a, I know that's just me speculating. So I yeah I don't know if I have have a kind of clear answer to that. Okay, so it's, if, if we're talking about space governance, is there any reason to think okay in the far future we can expect that space will be colonized either by you know, like a fully artificial um, uh, intelligence or by simulations of humans like M's. In either case, it's not clear that these entities would feel that constrained by whatever norms of space governance we detail now. What is the reason for thinking that, you know, any sort of charter or constitution that the UN might build, uh, regardless of how, I, I don't know, how sane it is, will be the basis of, of which like the actual long run fate of space uh, is decided upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess I know the first thing I want to say is that it does in fact feel like an extremely long shot to expect that any kind of norms you end up agreeing on now, even if they're good, flow through to the point where they really matter, um, if they ever do. But 
okay, so you can ask like what are the worlds in which this this like early thinking does end up being uh being good? On the M point, I don't know, like I can imagine, for instance, the US constitution surviving in importance, at least to some extent, if digital people come along for the right. It's not obvious why there's some discontinuity there. I guess the the important thing is considering what happens after anything like kind of transformative artificial intelligence arrives. My guess is that the worlds in which this is like even kind of remotely, this like, you know, super long-term, what norms should we have for settling space? The worlds in which this matters or does anything <laughs> worthwhile are uh, worlds in which, you know, alignment goes well, right? And it goes well in the sense that there's a significant sense in which humans are still in the driving seat. And when they're looking for precedents, they just look to existing like institutions of norms. So I don't know, that seems kind of, there's like so many variables here that this seems like a fairly narrow kind of set of worlds, but I don't know, it seems, seems pretty possible. And then it's also kind of like, you know, settling the moon or Mars, where that is just like much easier to imagine how this stuff actually kind of ends up influencing or positively influencing how things turn out. Feels worth pointing out that there are things that really plausibly matter when we're thinking about space that aren't just like thinking about these crazy kind of very long run sci-fi um, scenarios, although they are like pretty fun to think about. One is that there's just a ton of like pretty important infrastructure kind of currently orbiting the earth and also anti-satellite weapons are being built. And my impression is, well, in fact, I think it's the case that there is a kind of worryingly small amount of um, agreement and regulation about the use of those weapons. Um, maybe that puts you in a kind of analogous position to not having many agreements over the use of nuclear weapons, although maybe less worrying in certain respects, but still it seems worth taking that seriously and thinking about how to make progress there. Yeah, I think it's just like a ton of other kind of near-term considerations. There's this great graph actually um, on our and data, which I, I guess I can send you the link to after this. Uh, which shows the number of objects launched into orbit, um, especially low Earth orbit, just over time. And it's just like perfect hockey stick. And I know it's like quite a nice illustration of why you might might kind of pay to like think about how to make sure this stuff goes well. And the story behind that graph is kind of fun as well. I was like messing around on some UN website, which had, it was just like this database, incredible database, which has more or less every kind of officially recorded launch logged with like all this data about like how many objects were contained or whatever it was like the clunkiest api you've ever seen um you have to like manually like click through each page and it takes like five seconds to load and you have to like scrape it somewhere so i was like okay this is great that this exists i am not like remotely sophisticated enough to know how to like make use of it but i emailed the owl and data people saying fyi this exists if you happen to have like you know a ton of time to burn then then have added and um ed ed Mato from i want data got back to me like a month later like hey i had a free day all done and it's like up on the website it's so cool so cool cool okay i think that's that's my space rambling do i guess I, I i'd quite like to ask you a couple of questions if that's all right i realize i've been kind of hogging the airwaves yeah so here's one thing i've just been <laughs> interested to know you're doing this like blogging and podcasting right now but yeah what's next like 2024 Dwarkesh, what is he doing? I think um, I, I'll, I'll probably be, I've just had, I don't know, the, the idea of uh, building a startup has been very compelling to me. And I, not necessarily from, I think it's the most impactful thing uh, that could possibly be done. Although I think it is very impactful, but it just, I don't know, it, it just like, if you have a, people tend to have like different things that are like, I, I want to be a doctor or something that it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that's uh, stuck in your head. So, yeah, I think that's probably what I'll um, be attempting to do in 2024. I don't, I, I think the situation in which I like remain a blogger and podcaster is if it just turns out to be like a, I don't know, if, if I have, if the podcast just becomes like really huge, right? At that point, it might make more sense that, oh, like actually this is a way. Currently, I think the, the impact the podcast has is like, at like at like zero point zero 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 one, and then the, the point zero one is just me getting to learn about a lot of different things. So I, I think for for it to have any, um, not necessarily that it has to be thought of in terms of impact, 
but in terms of like how useful yeah. is it i think it's only the case if it like mm. really becomes much bigger nice that sounds great maybe this is getting right to the start of the conversation what about what about a non-profit startup all the same like excitement if you have a great idea you kind of skip the fundraising stage more freedom because you don't <laughs> need to like make <laughs> well though you still have to raise money right <laughs> sure but like if it's a great idea then i'm sure there'll be like support to make it happen yeah, if, if there's something where I, I don't see a way to mm -hmm. like profitably do it, and I think it's very important that it be done, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't be opposed to it. Is that, by the way, where you're leaning? Like, if I asked you in 2024, what is Finn doing? Uh, do you have a nonprofit startup? I don't have something concrete in mind. That kind of thing feels very exciting to me to at least okay. at least try out. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, yeah, I think. Um, I, I, I guess my prior is that there are profitable ways to do many things if you're more creative about it. There are obvious counterexamples of so many different things where, yeah, I could not tell you how you could make that profitable, right? Like if you have uh, like something like One Day Sooner where they're trying to, you know, speed up challenge trials, it's like, how, how is that a startup? It's not clear. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that, that there's like a big a branch of the decision tree where I think that's the most compelling thing I could do. Nice. And maybe a connected question is, I'm curious what you think EA in general is underrating from your point of view. Also, maybe another question you can answer said is like what you think, like I am personally getting wrong or got wrong, but maybe the kind of the more general question is a more interesting one for most people. So I think when you have statements um, which are somewhat ephemeral or ambiguous, like, let's say there's like a, some historian like uh, Toynbee, right? He wrote a study of history. And one of the things he says in it is like civilizations die when um, the elites lose confidence in the norms that they're setting and they're uh, in their it lose the confidence to rule. That, that, okay, so I, I, I don't think that's like actually an S, X risk, right? I, I'm just like trying to use that as an example, like something that comes up off the top of my head. It's the kind of thing um, it, like it could be true. I don't know how I would think about it in a sort of, I mean, it doesn't seem tractable. I, I don't know how I would even analyze whether it's true or not using, uh, using the modes of analyzing importance of uh, topics that we've been using throughout this conversation. I, I don't know what that implies for EA because it's not clear to me, like maybe EA shouldn't be taking things that are vague and ambiguous like that seriously to begin with, right? Yeah, I I if there is some interesting way to think about statements like that, from a perspective that EAs could appreciate, including myself, from a perspective that I could appreciate, um, I'd be really interested uh, to see what that would be. Because it, there does seem to be a disconnect where when I talk to my friends who are intellectually um, in inclined, um, who have a lot of interesting ideas, requiring a sort of like translation layer, almost like a compiler uh, that you, uh, or, or like a transpiler that, that you know, uh, converts, uh, uh, you know, code from this language into like assembly here. Um, it, it does create a little bit of inefficiency and potentially uh, a loss of topics that could be talked about. Nice. That feels like a great answer. I, I just say it's something I'm kind of right about as well, especially in leading towards a more kind of speculative, long-termist end. Um, it seems really important right. to like keep hold of like some real truth-seeking attitudes where those kind of like where the obvious feedback of where you're, whether you're getting things right or wrong is is much harder and often you don't have the luxury of, of having that so yeah i think just like keeping that attitude in mind seems like very important i like that well, what, what is your answer by the way what do, you, what do you think that you should improve on yeah i guess off the top of my head maybe i have two answers which like go in exact opposite directions so one answer is that one kind of something that looks a bit like a failure mode that i'm a bit worried about is as or if the movement grows significantly then the ideas that kind of originally motivated it that were like quite new and um, exciting and important ideas somewhat kind of dilute maybe because it's like you i guess it's related to what you said you kind of lose these attitudes of like just taking weird ideas seriously like scrutinizing one another quite a lot and it becomes a bit like i don't know greenwashing or something where like the language stays but the real kind of like fire behind it of like taking impact really seriously rather than just saying the right things that kind of fades away so i don't know if it, i don't think i want to say EA is currently underrating that in any important sense but it's like something that seems worth having as a you know kind of worry on the radar and then like the roughly opposite thing <laughs> that seems also worth worrying about is i think it's just really worth paying attention or like uh it's worth 
considering best case outcomes where um, uh, a lot of this stuff maybe grows um, quite considerably, you know, thinking about how this stuff is like, could become mainstream, I think thinking about really scalable projects as well as just like little fun kind of interventions on on margins, there's at least some chance that becomes like very important. Um, and so as such, you know, one part of that is maybe just like learning to make a lot of these fields legible and attractive to um, people who could contribute, who are like learning about it for the first time. Um, and just, yeah, in general, planning for the best case, which could mean just like being thinking in very ambitious terms, thinking about things going very well. That just also seems worth doing. So I think it's a very vague answer, but maybe that's, um, yeah, maybe not worth keeping in, but that's my answer. Perhaps, uh, you know, opposite to what you were saying about EA not taking weird ideas too seriously in the future, is maybe they are taking uh, weird ideas too seriously now. It could be the case that just following basic common sense morality, kind of like what Tyler Cowen talks about in Severn Attachments, is really the most effective ways to deal with many threats, even weird threats. If you have if you have areas that are more specul speculative, like bio risk or AI, where it's not even clear that the things you're doing to address them are necessarily making them better. I know there's concern in the movement, like the initial grant that they gave to OpenAI might have like sped up um, AI doom. Um, Maybe the best case scenario in cases where there's a lot of ambiguity is to just do more common sense things like, and maybe this is also applicable to things like global health where malaria nets are great, but the way that hundreds of millions of people have been left out of poverty is just through implementing capitalism, right? It's not through uh, targeted interventions like that. I, again, I don't know what this implies for the movement in general, like even if like just implementing like the neoliberal agenda is the best way to like decrease poverty. Like what is, what does that mean that somebody should do if they're yeah. What does that mean you should do with a marginal million dollars? Right. So it's not clear to me. It's something I hope I'll know more about in like five to 10 years is I'd be very curious to talk to future me about like, what does he think about common sense morality versus taking weird ideas seriously? I think like one way of thinking about quote unquote weird ideas is that in some sense, they are the result of like taking a bunch of common sense starting points and then just like really reflecting on them hard and seeing what comes out. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think maybe the, the question is like, how much trust should we place on those like reflective processes versus like how much, what should I prior be on like weird ideas being true because they're, because they're weird, is that like good or bad? And then like separately, I don't know, one thing that just seems kind of obvious and important is if you take these ideas, like first of all, you should ask yourself whether you like actually believe them or whether they are like kind of fun to like say or you're like you're just kind of saying that you believe them and then sometimes i know it's like fun to say with ideas but it's like okay i actually don't have good grounds to believe this and then second of all if you do in fact believe something it's like really valuable to ask if you think this thing is really important and true um why aren't you working on it if you have the opportunity to work on it this is like the hamming question right what's the most important problem in your field and then um what's stopping you from from working on it and obviously look, many people have the luxury of like dropping out everything and and working on the things that they in fact believe are really important but if you do have that that opportunity then that's a question which i know is maybe just valuable to to ask maybe this like this is a meta objection to ea which is that i'm aware of a lot of potential objections to ea like the, the ones we were just talking about but there's so many other ones where people will identify yeah yeah that's an interesting point and then, like, nobody knows what to do about it, right? It's like, uh, uh, you know, should we take common sense uh, morality more seriously? Should we take weird ideas more seriously? It's like, oh, that is an interesting debate. And then, but how do you resolve that? I, I don't know how to resolve that. I don't know if somebody's come up with a good way to resolve that. Uh, I guess it kind of hooks into the long reflection stuff a little mm. bit. Because one answer here is just time. So I think the story of people raising concerns about AI is maybe instructive here, where, you know, early on you get some real kind of just, like, radical out there researchers or writers who are kind of raising this as a worry there's a lot of kind of like weird baggage attached to the what they write and then maybe you get like a first book or two and then you get like more kind of prestigious or established um people expressing concerns i think one way to accelerate that process when it's like worth accelerating is just to ask that question right like do i in fact see like can i go along with this argument do I see a, a hole in it? And then if the answer is no, like if it just kind of checks out, even if you're obviously going to always going to be uncertain, but if it's like, yeah, this seems 
seems kind of reasonable, then um, by default, you might just like spend a few years being like, just kind of living like, oh yeah, this is thing that I guess I think is true, but I'm not really acting on. You can't just like skip that step and be like, well, just act mm. on now. I'm not sure I agree. I think um, maybe maybe an analogy here is like, I don't know, you're in a relationship and you think like, oh, well, I don't see what's wrong with this relationship. So um, instead of just waiting a few years to like try to find something wrong with it, might as well just tie the knot now and get married. I, I think it's something similar with, um, I, I think of failure mode if you maybe not ne- because we're EAs, we wouldn't see it in EA, but we can see it generally in the world, yeah. is that people just come to a conclusions about how the world works or how the world ought to work uh, too early in life where when they don't yeah. seem to know, uh, know that much about what is optimal and what is yeah, possible. Yeah, 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 that's a great point. So yeah, maybe, maybe they should just wait a little longer. Maybe just like integrate like these weird radical ideas as things that exist in the world and wait until you're like late 20s mm-hmm. until you decide actually, this is the thing I should do with the rest of my career or with my uh, political uh, rights or whatever. Yeah, I think that's actually just a really good point. I think maybe I'd want to kind of walk back what I said based on on that. But I think there's some version of it which I'd still really endorse, which is maybe like, you know, spent like some time reflecting on this such that I don't expect further reflection is going to like radically Mm. change what I think. Um, You can maybe talk about uh, this being the case of like a group of people rather than a particular person. And I could just like really see this thing playing out where I just like believe it's important for a really long time without acting on it. And that's the thing which seems worth sure. skipping. I mean, to be to be a little tiny bit more concrete, like if you really think some of this, these potentially catastrophic risks just like are real and you think there are things that, that we can do about it, then it sure seems good to start working on this stuff. Mm. Um, and you really want to like avoid that regret of, you know, some years down the line, like, ah, oh, I really could have just started working on that earlier. There are occasions where this kind of thinking is, is useful, or at least kind of asking this question, like, what would I do right, do right now if I just like did what my kind of idealized self would endorse doing? Um, maybe that's useful. So it seems that if you're trying to pursue, I don't know, a career related to EA, there's like two steps where the first step is you have to get a position like the one you have right now, uh, where, where you're you know, learning a lot and figuring out future steps. And then the one after that is where you actually lead or uh, take ownership of a specific project, like a you know, nonprofit startup or something. Do you have any advice for somebody who is before step one? Huh, that's a really good question. I also will just do the annoying thing of saying, definitely other things you can do other than that, that kind of like two-step trajectory. But yeah, what? As in go directly to step two? Or, or what, just what, never what, go to step two and just like be a really excellent researcher or communicator or, and like anything else. Sure, sure, um, sure. I think like where you have the luxury of doing it, not kind of rushing into the most salient like career option and then retroactively justifying why it was the correct option, Mm-mm. I think is like quite a nice thing to bear in mind i suppose often it's quite uncomfortable obviously I don't do, want you, do to... you mean something like consulting yeah something like that yeah i mean the kind of the obvious advice here is that there is a website <laughs> designed to answer this question <laughs> uh which is eighty thousand hours oh yeah so maybe some there's a particular bit of advice from adk which i found very useful which was after i left uni i was like really unsure what i wanted to do um i was choosing between a couple options and I was like, oh my God, this is like such a big decision because I guess in this context, it's not only not only do you have to answer the question of what might be a good fit for me, what I might enjoy, but also like in some sense, what is like actually most important maybe? And how am I supposed to answer that given that like there's a ton of disagreement? And so I just like found myself like bashing my head against the wall of trying to get to a point where I was certain that like one option was better than the other. And um, the piece of advice that I found useful was that often you should just write off the possibility of becoming fully certain about what option is best. Instead, what you should do is you should reflect on the decision, like proactively, that is, you know, talk to people, write down your like thoughts and just like keep iterating on that until the like the dial stops moving backwards and forwards and just kind of settles on some particular uncertainty. So it's like, look, I guess I'm I'm a kind of 60% <laughs> 60% of 
seventy percent option A is better than B, and that hasn't really changed. Having done like a bunch of extra thinking, that's roughly speaking the point where it might be best to make the decision rather than holding out for um, certainty. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like kind of like gradient descent, where if, uh, if the loss function hasn't changed in the last iteration, you uh, you, you call it. Yeah, points. nice, like it, like it. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. It, though I, I I guess one problem maybe that somebody might face is that before they've actually done things, it's hard to know. Yeah. Uh, that like that's actually a like I, I, not that this is actually going to be my career, but I would have like the podcast was just something I did as in like I was bored during COVID and I uh, I, I yeah I, the yeah. classes went online and I just didn't have anything else to do. I don't think it's something I would have pursued if I ever thought of it. Well, I, I never thought of it as a career, right? So it's like, mm. um, but uh, just doing things like that can potentially lead you down interesting, um, interesting avenues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point. There was um, I guess we're both involved with this uh, blog prize. And there was a uh, like a kind of mini prize last month for people writing about like the idea of agency and what you just said, I think links into that really nicely. There's this kind of property of going from realizing you can do something to doing it, which just seems like both really valuable and learnable. So yeah, just like have, going from the idea of I could maybe do a little podcast series to like actually testing it and like being open to the possibility that it fails, but you learn something from it, just really valuable. Also, we were talking about sending cold emails in that same bit of the conversation, right? Like um, if there's someone you, you look up to and you have, you think it's like very plausible that you might end up in their like line of research and you think there's a bunch of things you could learn from them. As long as you're not like demanding a huge amount of their time or attention, then you can just like ask to talk to them. I think finding a mentor in places like this is uh, just like so useful and just like asking people if they could fill that role, like again, in a kind of friendly way, is just, um, you know, maybe it's a kind of a move people don't opt for a lot of the time. But yeah, just like taking the non-obvious options, being proactive about connecting to other people, seeing if you can like physically meet other people who are like interested in the same kind of weird things as you. Yeah, this is all like extremely obvious, but I guess it's stuff I kind of would really have benefited from learning um, earlier on. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing is, it's like uh, not clear how you should apply that in your own circumstance when you're um, when you're trying to decide what to do. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, let's uh, let, let's close out by talking about uh, just like plugging the effective ideas, uh, the blog prize you just mentioned, and then the the red teaming EA uh, contest. You, you want to talk? I, we already mentioned that earlier, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, if you just want to leave like links and just uh, again summarize them for. Cool, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so the. Criticism contest. The deadline is the first of September. The kind of canonical post that announces that is an EA forum post, which um, be very grateful if you could link to somewhere. But I'm you know happy to do that. And then price pool is um, at least a hundred thousand dollars, but possibly more if there's just like a lot of exceptional um, entries. Um, and then hopefully all the kind of relevant information is there. And then yeah, this this block prize as well, which I've been kind of helping run. I think you mentioned right at the start. So the like overall prize is yeah, hundred thousand dollars and up to five five of those prizes. Um but also there are these smaller monthly prizes that um I just mentioned. So last month was the theme was agency, and the theme uh this month is to write some response or some reflection on this uh series of blog posts uh called the Most Important Century uh blog post series by Holden Karnofsky. Which incidentally people should just read anyway. I think it's just really like truly excellent and kind yeah. of remarkable that like one of the most affecting like series of blog posts I've basically ever read was written by the co CEO of this like enormous um like philanthropic organization in his spare time. Right. It's just kind of insane. Um <laughs> Yeah, so uh the the website is uh effective ideas. Uh, dot org uh, yeah and then um obviously do uh where can people find you so your website twitter handle and then um yeah where can people find your podcast oh yeah so website is my name.com bitmorehouse.com twitter is my name um and podcast uh is called hear this idea as in listen this idea so it's just that phrase.com um and i'm sure if you if you kind of google it it'll it'll come up
Um, but, but by the way, what is your uh, what is your probability distribution of how impactful these um, criticisms end up uh, being, or just uh, how good they end up being? Like, if you had to guess, what what, what is like your median outcome, uh, and then what is like your ninety ninth or ninetieth percentile outcome of how good these end up being? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. I feel like I want to say that doing this stuff is really hard. So um, I don't want to like discourage posting by saying this, but I think you know maybe the median submission is, you know, like really robustly useful, absolutely worth writing and submitting. That said, maybe the difference between the most valuable posts of this kind or work of this kind and the median kind of effort is probably very large, which is just to say that the the ceiling is, is really high. If you think you have a 1% chance of influencing $100 million of philanthropic spending, then there is some sense in which a you know impartial philanthropic donor might be willing to spend uh roughly one percent of that amount to kind of find out that information right which is like a million dollars so yeah this stuff can be like really really important i think uh yeah yeah okay excellent yeah the, so the, the stuff you're working on seems really interesting and the block prices seem uh like they're, they're gonna they might have a potentially very big impact i mean our our world views have been shaped so much by some of these bloggers we talked about so yeah I, I, if uh if this leads to one more of those uh that alone could be uh very valuable so finn thanks so much for coming on the podcast this was um the longest but also one of the most fun uh one of the most fun conversations i've gotten a chance to do the whole thing was so much fun thanks so much for having me thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did and you want to support the podcast the most helpful thing you can do is share it on social media and with your friends. Other than that, please like and subscribe on YouTube and leave good reviews on podcast platforms. Cheers. I'll see you next time.